بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته هلو uh, everybody uh, today إن شاء الله we'll discuss uh, approach for, for cardiology examination for basis exam uh, and this lecture will not be a replacement for the clinical practice and hands on on the patient but uh, we are trying in this uh, lecture Uh, to make it uh, easy approach and uh, trying to uh, memorize uh, the theoretical parts of the exam. Uh, I'd like first to confirm, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like firstly to acknowledge Dr. Ahmed Mayhalewa. He is uh, one of the best uh, clinical uh, uh, tutorial for uh, bases. Uh, just I'd like to emphasize on some important uh, issues here that uh, <clears throat> for a person who not uh, yet succeed in the exam, never give up, uh, keep going on and know that uh, success is a gift from Allah. Just do your best uh, and you will have your dreams uh, soon. Uh, my advice for you to train yourself to uh, subconsciously processing of the exam steps. So at the time of uh, exam, you are not uh, focused on how to do the steps of the exam. Uh, that is the value of doing training at this time. Uh, so you will be practice to Uh, make the steps of the exam uh, rapidly and to pick up the physical findings. And in exam only, you uh, let your brain or your mind find the positive finding and do analysis for these findings to reach the diagnosis and differential diagnosis. As I mentioned to you, this is not a replacement for hands-on. You have to do this uh, practically on your patient's real uh, life. Uh, we'll try to make it easy, inshallah. The most important cases in the clinical exam for cardiology session uh, coming like murmur of the valvular disease, like aortic stenosis, uh, aortic regurgitation, mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and VSCD. Or sometimes come uh, valve replacement like uh, mitral valve replacement or aortic valve replacement or double valve replacement, I mean double mitral and aortic valve replacement. Or sometimes uh, the congenital heart disease especially uh, either Menger syndrome or fellow tetralogy. Either Menger syndrome, as we will know, that it is a uh, end complication of uh, all the uh, VCD or ACD beta inductors arteriosus when the pulmonary hypertension developed and there is irreversible pulmonary hypertension. Uh, on top of this, you can either have one of the murmur, uh, one of the replacement, uh, plus or minus, you might have a regular rhythm, like AF, but it is not better to mention atrial fibrillation, because atrial fibrillation is an ECG diagnosis, just to mention that it is a regular irregularity pulse. Plus or minus, maybe there is pulmonary hypertension, especially in case of mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation or any uh, shunt disease or also plus or minus congestive heart failure, either right-sided heart failure or left-sided heart failure. Uh, the most important uh, issue here is how to present your case after finish the exam. <clears throat> we can make it easy, like we have to mention, we need to mention the following. Uh, the patient has the peripheral findings that you will find in the patient, like uh, uh, color cyanosis, jaundice, uh, Valor, if the patient has clubbing or no, if there is any specific scar in the chest or any chest deformity, uh, if you find any midline sternotomy scar, base maker scar like this. So you firstly describe the surrounding of the patient, then uh, present the pulse. We will go to the pulse by details, but at least you have to mention the pulse with a full comment, rate, rhythm, and volume, and special character if present. Like you mentioned, the pulse is 70 beat per minute, uh, regular, equal on both sides, no special character, average volume, with no radio radial delay or radio femoral delay, and intact or cell speeds or intact peripheral pulsation. This will be the complete comment on the pulse. 
then go to the GVB uh, to mention is it elevated or not elevated and the waveform if you can uh, describe the waveform uh, especially the A wave and V wave we will mention all this in details later but just to enumerate then by order you will go to the apex to check the site of the apex and if it, it is displaced or undisplaced then the heart murmur regarding the S1 and S2 if S1 is audible or soft or loud, the S2 is audible or soft or loud. Plus or minus, if you have a metallic valve replacement, the prosthetic click. If uh, do you hear this prosthetic click coincides with the S1, so it will be mitral valve replacement, or coincide with the S2, so it will be aortic valve replacement. Then go, go to the murmurs and describe the murmur by the full description. We'll mention that also in details. Uh, is this murmur is diastolic or systolic and if there is any specific uh, site or specific radiation. In case of prosthetic valve, <coughs> uh, you have to uh, comment about uh, that this prosthetic valve is functioning well, i.e. you can hear the audible metallic click and definitely in the exam you will not face a case of uh, malfunction of the metallic valve. You will definitely hear the metallic click and try to Time this metallic click is it with the our with the S1 or with the S2, and the plus or minus mention if uh, there is any signs of over anticoagulation, especially if there is any chemosis or purpura, because as you know the prosthetic valve patient usually taking warfarin or uh, comedine. This is only oral anticoagulant suitable for prosthetic valve replacement. The NOAC is still uh, off label, cannot be used in. Uh, metallic valve replacement, the new generation, which is like abixaban and rivaroxaban, and the bigger trend is not yet approved for metallic valve uh, replacement. Uh, plus or minus, there is three important things you have to mention it by positive or by negative, especially pulmonary hypertension, if there is pulmonary hypertension or no, also congestive heart failure, if it's present or no, right sided or left sided, and plus or minus infective endocarditis, the stigma of infective endocarditis, is it present or no? Even if it is not present, you have to mention this. There is no signs of pulmonary hypertension, there is no signs of congestive heart failure, there is no stigmata of infective endocarditis. And finally, you can mention my conclusion that this patient has a clinical picture suggestive of uh, mitral regurgitation for further evaluation. That is, will be the full comment of presentation in cardiology case. So start by the periphery, then pulse, GVB, apex, heart sounds, murmur, remember in prosthetic valve, and the important three uh, to mention by positive or negative, and finally the conclusion. Cardiovascular examination, we will start by uh, introduction. Uh, you, have, you need to introduce yourself to the patient. I am Dr. Uh, Marabi. Uh, I will examine your uh, heart and uh, your body. Is it okay with you? Do you have any pain or discomfort? Okay, if you have any pain or discomfort, please let me know. This is the introduction. And before that, you have to make uh, hand washing, okay, and greeting for the patient. Then you, then you take a general survey in the top uh, of the bed, especially at the, on the leg side. Then examine the hand by the order. Examine the hand, pulse, GPB, and the carotid pulsation. Then examine the face, especially the eyes and mouth. Then examine the lower limb. All that you are examining all the non cardiac part of the patient. Then go to the heart. Inspection, palpation. There is no percussion and auscultation. So inspection, palpation, auscultation. Then let the patient to set up to examine the lung base and sacral edema, and after that end of the examination by uh, thank the patient and cover the patient and wash your hand. Then go uh, face the examiner. As we mentioned before the start examination, we do hand sterilization, hand washing, and greeting to the patient. Say hello, uh, Mr. Fulan or Mrs. X, Mr. X. Uh, Nice to meet you. I am Dr. Rabi. Um, I will examine your heart and your body. Is it okay with you? Just to gain a consent. Then ask him briefly if you have any pain or discomfort, please uh, let me know. Then emphasize on putting the patient in a position 45 degree. 
in general survey inspection while you are at the bedside of the patient, uh, put your hand behind your back and to go a few steps at the bed end of the patient. Try to inspect all the patient, take a general look to take a clue and to see if this patient is comfortable or distressed. Definitely the patient will be comfortable, mostly in the exam special. And check the surrounding. You can find some clues like patient is taking oxygen, there is cannula, there is a glycerite trinitrate spray beside him, so indicate he has ischemic heart disease, maybe walking aid, maybe he's on wheelchair. Also check any scar. A general survey, you have to expose the patient, good exposure, exposure of the chest and exposure of the two legs to see if there's any scars in the leg or any scar in the chest area, especially the coronary artery bypass graft scar or scar for a permanent pacemaker or saracotum scar. And check if there is any uh, chest deformities like uh, bictus excavatum or bictus carinatum. Uh, check the face if there is any malar rash, which denoting that the patient has mitral stenosis. And try to uh, search if the patient facial feature matching with any specific genetic disease like Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Noonan syndrome, Williams syndrome, Marfan syndrome. There's a specific characteristic murmurs with these diseases. Like Down, mostly there is VSD, Turner usually affecting the aortic area in the form of aortic stenosis or bicuspid aortic valve or aortic regurgitation or coarctation of the aorta or hypertension. Especially, this will be a female patient. Nunan mostly affects the pulmonary area, especially pulmonary stenosis. William disease affecting the aortic area, affecting going aortic stenosis. And uh, Marfan syndrome, as we know, the aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation or mitral valve prolapse. And checking the lower limb regarding if there is any edema or harvesting a scar for the couch. All this, you are doing this while you are taking a uh, general survey at the bedside in the leg side of the uh, coach of the patient. In general survey, you, you can see this finding that uh, the patient has harvested the scar in the leg and in the chest there is midline stenotum scar. So definitely this patient has cabbage. Plus or minus, maybe there is valve replacement, but at least you know that this is cabbage. If you find only scar in the chest, maybe this is valve uh, replacement, but for cabbage, there is, uh, should be either graft, maybe taken from the hand, so you can you need to check hand radial harvesting scar, or from the leg, lower limb softness vein harvesting scar, or sometimes they can do cabbage from the lima, and it will be the same opening. At this time, it will be confusing. But at least my, my message here, expose the patient chest and lower limb at the same time while you are doing the survey. Then we will go to each part of the examination. We will start by the hands. What we will see in the hands? We will examine the hands in the dorsum and in the bulb. For the dorsum, we are checking the cyanosis, any blue coloration of the nail, any clubbing, any splinter hemorrhage, Splinter hemorrhage suggests that the patient has infective endocarditis. And you can see tendon then serasma or tendon, tendon then soma, which is a manifestation of hyperlipidemia, which is a risk factor for ischemic heart disease for the patient. Uh, in the palm of the hand, you're checking the uh, temperature. Is it cold or warm? To know if the patient is hyperdynamic, so it will be warm or shocked, it will be cold. Checking tar staining that indicates that this patient has chronic heavy smoking before. Uh, Balmar erythema may indicate hyperdynamic circulation. And uh, Osler nodes and Janeway lesions, which is a manifestation or stigmata of infective endocarditis. Uh, are you following me? Just anyone to say yes? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, kindly note that uh, Osler nodes is a tender. It's tender nodes, but Janeway is uh, not tender. Okay. 
there is what's called a shamroth window. It is important for clubbing. I will tell you now, when you put the finger uh, tangential with each other, there is a window between the fingers. This is called a shamroth window. If it's blocked, it is the early stage of clubbing. Uh, the importance of clubbing in cardiology, there is three important, three important diseases make clubbing in cardiology. Effective endocarditis, number one, congenital cyanotic heart disease, and atrial myxoma. These are the three, three cases of clubbing in cardiology. So if you are examining cardiac case and you find clubbing, either this infective endocarditis or congenital cyanotic heart disease, especially palatotrology and Ivan Menger uh, syndrome, or atrial myxoma. For uh, clubbing, as you see, that uh, there is obliteration of this angle, uh, this angle here and the angle here. When you put the finger with, uh, tangential with each other, it should be a small uh, window. Uh, if this window is uh, closed, this is uh, called Shamru window. If it's closed, this is called uh, clubbing. And there is a stages of clubbing from one to four. Started by stage one, yeah, normal appearance, but there is increase in the uh, fluctuancy of the nail bit. Uh, then this loss of this angle, and after that increase the curvature, and after that it be like a drumstick appearance. What is the differential diagnosis of clubbing in general? You can find the clubbing in pulmonology cases, cardiology cases, GIT, and endocrinology. We will mention each one in a separate uh, item. As we uh, mentioned that clubbing in cardiology, there is a clue for infective endocarditis. You better to search for other findings, especially the uh, splinter hemorrhage under the nail bed or Osler nodes. It will be like uh, this, it will be painful, tender. And Janeway lesion like a macule can be in the hand or in the feet. And uh, if you do a fungus examination, you will find the rough spots. This is peripheral stigmatic infective endocarditis. Another picture also is the same. This is splinter hemorrhage. This is the uh, Osler nodes, like this, like this. It's tender and cannot touch the patient. And this is Janeway lesion in the feet. And you can find conjunctival petechiae, uh, the conjunctival uh, hemorrhage as a Manifestation of the infective endocarditis, the vascular phenomena, and the neurological phenomena. Other important picture here the Van uh, here in the eye, this indicates that there is hyperlipidemia. You can find the eruptive zensoma, especially the extensor surface of the hand or the ankle, tendo Achilles, eruptive zensoma here and here, like this. Next, after checking the hand, we will go to the pulse. What about the pulse? What we have to check in the pulse? The rate is very important to know how many minutes, how many beats per minute. And we check the pulse in both hands simultaneously. So you hold the two hands of the patient simultaneously, checking the pulse to know if there is any radio, radio, radial delay. It indicates there is coarctation of the section of the aorta. Definitely, it will not become in the exam a yeah, section like this, but you have to show the examiner that you are examining the radial pulse simultaneously bilaterally. Then the rhythm, check if the pulse is regular or irregular. Do not say it is uh, AF as I mentioned, Sh say it is a regular irregularity pulse. So rate, rhythm, radio radial delay, you check it by simultaneously checking the radial pulse and radio femoral delay, you can ask the patient, can I put my hand in the growing area? and to check if there is any radio, radio delay, radio femoral delay. Uh, now, sometimes it is not recommended uh, to be done, and some examiner, when, you, when he see you doing this, he said to you, no need. Then, it checks the collapsing pulse. This is very important. It's called water hammer pulse. You catch the uh, hand of the patient. One hand, uh, you, you catch the pulse, and the other hand with the, at the forearm, and raise the hand abruptly above the level of the head of the patient, but after permission and ask the patient, do you have any shoulder pain? He will say no. Yes, sir, I will elevate your head above, okay, and elevate rapidly and try to feel the pounding pulse of collapsing pulse with your other hand. This picture shows you that 
with both your hand, you are examining the pulse. One at the radial and the other at the forearm, and elevate the arm of the patient suddenly, abruptly, above the level of the head, and try to feel simultaneously and immediately after you elevate the uh, hand of the patient. Uh, collapsing pulse can be physiological if the patient has fever or pregnancy, can uh, occur in states of increased cardiac output like anemia or thyrotoxicosis, or can be due to cardiac lesions. The most important one is aortic regurgitation. Also, it can be in hyperdynamic circulation like mitral regurgitation as well as. So it is not a specific for aortic regurgitation. This is the most important. If you find collapsing pulse, it may be anemia, maybe pregnancy, fever, maybe aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation. Uh, definitely, you should يعني, uh, put in your mind that blood pressure measurement is very important in both arms, as you did in pulse examination, but it is not practically to be done in the exam. So this is uh, how to examine the pulse rate, risk, Radio radial delay, radio femoral delay now obsolete and collapsing pulse. After that, put in your mind the comment of the pulse. You have seven items to comment on the pulse the rate, the rate, regular or irregular, and equal in both sides or unequal, and check the volume and special character of the pulse, and radio femoral delay and peripheral pulsation. This is the full comment of the pulse. So, if you do a scenario, okay, uh, on examination of this gentleman, he has pulse rate of 70 per minute, regular, equal in both sides, no special character, average volume, and no radiofemoral delay with intact peripheral pulsation, which is the dorsal speed that you will feel when you examine the lower limb. This is the full comment on the pulse. Uh, volume of the pulse can be low volume, especially in the aortic stenosis, so the cardiac output is will be little. So the volume will be low, is low volume, and the high volume in our tick regurgitation is the opposite. Uh, for the special character of the pulse, uh, it is the same. There is slow rising pulse. Slow rising pulse, it means the difference between systolic and diastolic is low, which occur in our tick stenosis. Or collapsing pulse, which is called the, like hyperdynamic circulation or our tick regurgitation, there is a big difference between systole and diastole, so it is called a collapsing pulse or uh, jerky pulse in severe mitral regurgitation. This is a very important slide regarding the full comment on uh, the pulse while you present in front of the expert. Then after pulse, we are uh, moved from hand, then pulse, then now we are going up to the shoulder and the neck of the patient. At the neck, we'll examine the GVB and carotid pulsation. Confirm that the patient at the 45 degrees this is very important, okay? and uh, ask the patient to turn his head to the other side. And you will examine the GVB and the carotid pulsation. GVB is seen, not, not palpated. So GVB, to see the GVB, is it elevated or not elevated? And if there is any specific character in its waveform. Uh, normally, the GVB is uh, about four uh, centimeter water above the uh, sternal angle or manubrium sternoid. If elevated more than this, this is called elevated GVB. No need to measure it uh, exactly. Either it is elevated or not elevated. Uh, then check the, if you can find the V wave. If the V wave is elevated more, this is a clue of tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation, and by this, you have to search for other signs of pulmonary hypertension. Remember, in the atrial fibrillation, there is loss of A wave. This is the two waves that is, uh, yani, that is the, you are uh, practically can assess in the exam, the A wave and V wave. Other Y descend and uh, X descend and uh, C wave, it is difficult uh, yani, clinically, but it is theoretically can be, but difficult to clinic. Uh, there is hepatojugular reflux. Now it is not uh, preferable to be done, uh, but you can, yani, you have to know idea about that. You're doing palpation of the liver and the compression of the liver by two hands, by manual palpation, and you check if there is elevation of the jugular pulse while you press the liver. This means that there is a, a tricuspid regurgitation or right sided heart failure. So make the annulus of the tricuspid valve is wide, so the venous return is reflected to the right atrium and from right atrium to the GVP. But it is now uh, not done. Carotid pulsation. Uh, 
uh, it is better to not palpate the carotid pulsation, leave it to the auscultation. Uh, because auscultation will give you a good idea, especially in aortic stenosis, to check if this aortic stenosis are related to the carotid area or no. And uh, there is, a, يعني, theoretically speaking, that uh, it is preferable to auscultate the carotid firstly before palpate it, because if you palpate it and there is a thermotus plaque or something like this, you may dislodge this plaque and make the patient uh, have a stroke. So theoretically, the carotid pulsation better to be useful. Uh, I will give you some يعني, review about the GVB, rapid review. Uh, this is a sternocleidomastoid muscle from the mastoid process to the uh, clavicle. Here is the clavicle. And here is the sternum, so it's called sternocleidomastoid. The uh, GVB is behind the sternocleidomastoid. So you see the GVB wave through the movement of the, of the muscle. So as I mentioned to you, the GVB is not palpated. So not put your hand to check the GVB. The hand put it for carotid. But GVB is seen. Uh, you have to make the patient in a 45 degree, away from the coach by the 45 degree. And you are measuring the uh, distance from the manubrium sternoid uh, to the level of the GVB. The uh, GVB is, you are checking the jugular venous uh, pressure. It means uh, this distance above the sternal angle, above the manubrium sternae and above. Okay, the fixed uh, measure from the manubrium sternae to the center of the uh, right atrium, it is fixed, five centimeters. So you are checking this, this is a clinical part you are checking. Uh, and to know it is, if you mention centimeter water or uh, millimeter mercury, it is one, it is not a big difference because this is the equation. 1.3 centimeter water is equal to one millimeter mercury. For the wave, as we mentioned, we have three waves, A wave and C wave and V wave, and we have two descent, X descent and Y descent. This will not be in the exam, but I'd like to mention it for you just for the sake of interest and just to better to know this uh, theoretically. Uh, that the GVB, we have three waves and two descent, A wave, C wave, and V wave. And we have X descent and Y descent. Practically speaking, what you are seeing or what you can assess is the A wave and V wave. GVB is indicating the pressure in the right atrium. It indicates the pressure in the right atrium. Okay. Each uh, wave is denoting something. A wave is abbreviation of atrial contraction. So A wave it means atrial contraction. After after that atrial contraction, uh, you will find that the C wave. C wave is the cusp. C abbreviation of the cusp. It means the tricuspid valve cusp. Right tricuspid valve because we are speaking about right atrium. So we speak the right atrium and the tricuspid valve is the uh, reflection of the GVB. C wave, it means that the tricuspid valve, uh, it will make a bulge in the size of the right atrium. And uh, this will increase the pressure in the right atrium again while the ventricle is making contraction. The V wave is uh, abbreviation of uh, venous return means there's atrial filling. There's venous return coming from severe vena cava and inferior vena cava, so there's atrial filling, so the V wave is going up. This is the three up wave. Regarding the descent, there is X descent, it means atrial relaxation to accommodate the uh, next uh, venous return. And at this time, the tricuspid valve is pulled down, pulled down to make the right atrium is wide space, so there is atrial uh, relaxation, this uh, makes the X descent. So X descent is due to atrial is relaxed and tricuspid valve is going down to accommodate the venous return going inside the right atrium. Uh, regarding the Y, the Y descent, it's due to, uh, at this time, the tricuspid valve is opened and there's gush of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle and rapid filling of blood to the 
right uh, right ventricle so this uh, blood flow make a wide descent what you actually will see is the a wave and the v wave how to coincide this with the s and s1 and s2 the a wave is just before the carotid pulse because the carotid carotid pulsation is usually with the s1 the uh, you will see a wave is just before the carotid pulsation while the v wave is after the uh, carotid pulsation regarding the abnormalities of this gvd we have four main importance abnormalities the large a wave large a wave it means that the atrial contraction is doing in with a high big pressure it occurs in tricuspid stenosis because there's closure of the tricuspid or pulmonary stenosis so the right side of the heart pressure is increased or in case of pulmonary hypertension there is large a wave a very large a wave it's called canon a wave it's most characteristic for complete heart block is large canon a wave large v wave is very important in case of tricuspid regurgitation and the pulmonary hypertension and the rapid wide descent in case of a constrictive pericarditis and tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, the most important question is what is the difference between venous pulsation and carotid pulsation? Uh, the venous pulsation, as I mentioned to you, it is seen, but the carotid pulsation is felt, is number one. Number two, that uh, venous pulsation, there is double waveform, the A wave and V wave, and uh, but carotid pulsation is a single pulsation. The venous pulsation can be compressible. I mean gentle. By gentle compression, you can uh, make obstruction of this venous pulsation, while the arterial pulsation is difficult to be compressed easily because the arterial wall is thick, but the venous wall is thin. Uh, also, the effect of inspiration on the GVB. With inspiration, inspiration there is a decrease of GVB because in inspiration, there is negative intrathoracic pressure so there is pull of the venous return is uh, coming so the gvb column will be decreased this is uh, very important but the carotid pulsation has no effect the breathing has no effect on carotid pulsation also change the position has effect on venous pulsation when the patient uh, change from uh, supine to uh, sitting position or sorry from sitting to supine position there is gvb will be elevated and this is the best uh, position to check the GVB while the patient is fortified between the subline and between the sitting up. Uh, also, the hepatojugular reflux, as I told you, it is not recommended now, but to know that jugular venous pressure uh, is affected by, hepatic, uh, by hepatojugular reflux in case of tricuspid regurgitation, but there is no effect uh, on carotid pulsation by the hepatojugular reflux. So, this is the, the mean five, six difference between the venous pulsation and carotid pulsation. Uh, just to know what is the causes of elevated GVB, GVB will elevate it in uh, any disease affecting the right side of the heart or make the right side pressure is elevated in case of uh, right ventricular failure, in case of tricuspid regurgitation or tricuspid stenosis. Also, in case of pericardial compression, when the pericardium is compressed like constricted pericarditis or tamponade, there is elevation of GVB, and there is a characteristic sign called Cosmal sign. Cosmal sign, it means paradoxical rise in GVB during inspiration. As I mentioned to you before, the, during inspiration, there is negative intrathoracic pressure, so there is suction of the venous return from severe vena cava and inferior vena cava going inside the uh, right atrium. Uh, so it is expected that GVB to be decreased, but in case of constriction of the pericardium, there is less elasticity of the pericardium and less elasticity uh, for the heart to expand. Uh, at this time, during inspiration, the GVB will be elevated due to engorgement of the vessels. Also, in case of sub uh, severe vena cava obstruction and in case volume overload, like in case of renal failure, this is the cause of elevated GVB. Regarding causes of lowered GVB, definitely it would be uh, the dehydration and the uh, hypovolemia. Okay. Just a question regarding uh, why the internal jugular vein is preferred than the external jugular vein. Why we are not measuring the external jugular vein? The, the vein that is apparently in the skin, this is external jugular, which are we are not minded by it. 
we are minded by the internal jugular vein, uh, which moves the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle by its uh, movement. The answer of this question is uh, by this. We have here the uh, right, right atrium, and right atrium is conducted by the, this is the uh, right internal jugular, and this is the left internal jugular. Left internal jugular connected by the innominate vein and then to the superior vinicle. So when we need to know what has happened inside the right atrium, it's preferable to check the right internal jugular uh, vein, not the left and not the external jugular. Because uh, anatomically, the internal jugular vein is closer and in direct contact with the right atrium. And number two, it is valveless, so the pulsation is reflecting the pressure in the right atrium. Uh, on the other hand, the external jugular vein is, has uh, some uh, valves. And also, if uh, there is a vasoconstriction uh, due to any cause like hypotension, it can affect the external jugular vein, but will not affect the internal jugular vein. And finally, uh, the external jugular vein is superficially and can be liable for kinking. So these causes lead us uh, depend more on the uh, internal jugular vein, not the external jugular vein. The second question, why we are using the right internal jugular and not the left internal jugular? Yani means when you check the GVB, you have to be on the right side of the patient. You cannot assess the GVB on the left side of the neck. Uh, because the right jugular vein is taking straight, but as you see before, it is a straight line between the right internal jugular and the right atrium directly. And the other cause, the left innominate vein, it is not a straight like this, as I see here, the innominate vein. So the uh, pressure here will not, be, will not be reflected as better as uh, when we check in the right internal jugular. Okay. Uh, now to let uh, you in a right track, we are start by the hand, then the neck, then we now we'll examine the face. Okay, in examination of the face, the eyes, and the mouth. In eyes, ask the patient to look up and look down to check the pallor and jaundice and any vancelasma if it's apparent to you. And for the mouth, you ask the patient to open the mouth to see if there is any central cyanosis, especially ask the patient to avert the tongue. Also check if there is any high arched bullet, which is specific for Marfan syndrome. So this uh, make a reflection that you will find aortic regurgitation or uh, uh, mitral valve collapse or mitral regurgitation, which is the most common with Marfan syndrome. Also, uh, poor dentation may give you a clue of subacute bacterial endocarditis. This is uh, palo and this is uh, uh, jaundice. Then after you examine the face, you will go to the lower limb. Lower limb to see if there is any lower limb edema and to check bitting or not bitting and to check the level. It is up to the ankle or mid uh, tibia or above the knee or reach, reach to the thigh or reach to the sacrum after that. And to check the dorsal species bilaterally. This is very important in, as we mentioned before, in examination of the peripheral pulse. We have to check that the dorsal species is intact and check if there is any scar, especially the softness vein harvesting scar. When you examine the edema, check here. This is the first part, the edema will increase in the below and uh, lateral to the medial malleus. Just gentle pressing and ask the patient firstly, I will press here, you have any pain, and press in this area while your eye is looking to the patient's eye. After that, we are we have uh, finished the peripheral examination of the heart. We will go now to the examination of the heart itself, starting to the uh, inspection. Uh, just let me best confirm, are you following me or you want any, any question, any concern? Yes, yes following. Okay. Uh, for inspection, now you will check the patient in the chest. You are now at the uh, chest of the patient and checking for any scars or chest uh, deformities. Uh, especially the most important scar here is a midline sternotum scar. Uh, 
midline stratum scar usually for the open heart surgery or for the uh, cabbage or valve replacement. Other scars also the uh, mitral uh, valvotomy scar. The mitral valvotomy scar. It is done in case of mitral stenosis the, by uh, they are doing left lateral sarcotomy scar. It is easy to miss because it is uh, usually uh, below the nipple and it can be uh, masked by the bra or by the skin crease. So try to check it uh, clearly. Also, base maker scar. We have to look at the left infraclavicular area. Check if there is any scar and put your hand to see if there is any prominence or not because sometimes we can have a feedback that you miss a permanent maker or you miss, you miss a scar because you, you did not you did not uh, check carefully uh, check the radial or the leg regarding radial artery harvesting scar or saphenous vein harvesting scar this is doing for cabbage as i mentioned before uh, either from the upper limb from the radial artery or from the lower limb from the uh, radial vein uh, also checking the chest wall deformity. You have famous Bictus excavatum and Bictus carinatum. Uh, yeah, to not be confused, carinatum coming from the cavity. So uh, we'll let you see the picture now. Here's a picture. So this is like a cavity. The sternum is becoming like a, this is called Bictus excavatum. Uh, like a cavity or sometimes uh, the Say it is like a showmaker when the showmaker is putting the show in the sternum to make uh, tabbing here area, so the sternum will be debris. This is Bictus exilavitum and Bictus carinatum. Carinatum is like a vision, vision chest, like the vision birds. You find the, their chest is like this. Uh, also check if there is gynecomastia, especially in the male, so it indicates that this patient has a heart failure or taking medication, especially the aldactone and the juxin. The side effect of this medication making gynecomastia. So this patient mostly has heart failure, so we can expect that he has functional tricuspidic agitation, functional mitral regurgitation. Okay. Uh, also check if any visible pulsation, especially at uh, the apex, in case of severe hypertension or left ventricular hypertrophy. This is regarding the inspection. I will see you now the most important scars. This is midline sternotomy scar in this area. This is the base maker scar below the left clavicle. This is the uh, anterolateral sarcotomy scar. This is posterolateral sarcotomy scar. Also in this area, you can find the uh, mitral valvoblastic scar. So this is, this is the the most important size to check the scar. Okay. After inspection, we will go to palpation. Palpation, you will palpate the uh, most important area, the apex and the left parasternal area and the pulmonary area and the aortic area. This is the four areas that you will put your hand to palpate. Uh, the apex, there is a special comment I will mention later. Uh, you have to check the site, the apex and size and the character and if there is thrill or no. Uh, for apex, you checking the apex, trying to count the place. Normally, it will be in the fifth intercostal space at mid clavicular line. Uh, if it is directed downward, sorry, outward and laterally, uh, this indicates that this is left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, if the apex directed like this, this is with, uh, with the right ventricular hypertrophy. But if the apex is downward and uh, laterally, this with the uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, we mentioned that later also, but this is a highlight uh, apex. Then you go to the left parasternal area and putting your heel, heel of the hand to check the heave. You have here uh, two things, the heave and the thrill. To not be confused, uh, the heave is the meaning of the, uh, like the sea, sea waves, this is the heave. The thrill is like the vibration of the mobile or like you are putting your hand on a cat. So this is the thrill. 
but the heave is a movement like you, when you put your hand, you feel that some something like a sea waves uh, move your hand abruptly, uh, slightly, and you feel you feel your fingers is going uh, away from the chest of the person. The left parasternal heave is uh, denoting that there is right ventricular pressure, and this is very important in pulmonary hypertension. I will give you a slide later uh, collecting all the signs of pulmonary hypertension. One of the one of the, these signs is the left parasternal uh, heave, uh, and from the name heave, checking by the heel heel of the uh, hands. But uh, left parasternal uh, thrill it's examined by the base of the fingers. Okay. Uh, systolic uh, systolic thrill is usually in the functional tricuspid regurgitation or in BSD. You will find thrill in the left upper sternal area in case of tricuspid regurgitation and BSD. Then you go up in the pulmonary area to check if there is any palpable pulmonary area. Palpable B2 in case of pulmonary hypertension. Or thrill, it in, uh, come in pulmonary stenosis or uh, atrial septal defect. And in the aortic area, you will find a thrill in the aortic area. This is means that there is aortic stenosis and a sign of severity of aortic stenosis. This is the hand of the examiner, of the candidate, to be like this. Uh, you are checking the left parasternal heave by the heel of the head. Okay. As I mentioned to you, the heave is like the wave of the sea, and the thrill is like uh, the vibration of the mobile, and it denotes a palpable murmur. So what is the thrill? It is a palpable murmur. So it indicates a severity of the murmur. And usually, the site of thrill is the same site of examining the murmur of specific uh, valve region. So if you find thrill in the aortic area, so it means aortic stenosis. If you find thrill in the apex, so it means this is a mitral valve region. After palpation, the most important thing in the apex, you have uh, to, uh, you need to do a full comment for the for the apex, in the form of the site and size and the character, uh, and if there is any thrill or no. This is the most important thing for the apex. Uh, the apex, as as I uh, mentioned to you before, you see the you try to count the the ribs and to reach the place of the apex, see if it is displaced or undisplaced. Normally, it will be in the left fifth intercostal space at the mid clavicular line. If it is uh, displaced to outward and uh, laterally, so it will matching with the right uh, ventricular hypertrophy, it's downward and laterally, this is matching with the uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, then the size of the apex is in one place or two places. Then the character of the apex, especially in some lesions like mitral stenosis. In mitral stenosis, you will find uh, you will find that it is called tabbing apex, tabbing apex or slabbing apex, which means palpable uh, first heart sound. This is tabbing apex, or maybe heaving, heaving apex. Heaving usually with the pressure overload, as in case of aortic stenosis, or maybe thrusting apex in case of hyperdynamic circulation. Okay, or you feel double uh, impulse in the apex. This is matching with the hookup. And after that, the uh, thrill, either systolic or diastolic. Uh, as I mentioned to you, the thrill is indicate the severity of the murmur. So mitral regurgitation, it is a band systolic murmur, so the thrill would be systolic. Mitral uh, stenosis is a uh, mid-diastolic rumbling murmur, so the thrill of mitral stenosis would be diastolic. This is the uh, comment on the apex. Site, size, character, and thrill. And here in the picture, he is counting the fingers to reach the apex and put the palm of the hand to locate the site and if it's extended in one space or more than two space and the character of the apex. Uh, to know the character, as I mentioned to you, can by a mnemonic is HBTV. HB, this is a mark of the uh, television mark. So HB, heaving with the pressure overload, but thrusting with the volume overload. So if you have volume overload, so the apex will be thrusting. 
you have pressure, pressure overloads, so the apex will be called heaving apex. Then after that, we reach to the inspection, uh, palpation, we'll go to the auscultation. Definitely, يعني, to be realistic with you, the auscultation is the main part of getting the lesion of, uh, for the heart uh, diseases, but the other uh, part of the examination, it might help you to a much extent. In auscultation, we examine each valve area in a specific place, and uh, after finishing the most important uh, valve area, we, then we check the carotid. So we'll go firstly to the apex, then to the uh, lower left sternum uh, area, then upper left bar sternum area, then to the pulmonary area, then aortic area, then the carotid area. This is the area that we put the stethoscope uh, on it and try to elicit the murmurs in each uh, place. In auscultation, uh, to be familiar with auscultation, each uh, Merman has a specific character. We will go to this uh, in the coming uh, in the coming uh, slides. Uh, but let me uh, tell you, uh, you may need to put your thumb in the carotid area. It will be help you to much extent uh, to try to coincide the uh, murmur and auscultation with the carotid pulse. The carotid pulse is with S1. So uh, any uh, lesions with the pulse, so it is related to uh, S1, and any murmur you will find it below this as a stolic, or if it's away, so it is a diastolic murmur. In apex, you check for the lesion in the apex, which is mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. Uh, when you check the mitral uh, lesion, you have to go to the axilla, especially putting the patient in a left lateral position. So at ABEX, you are, you are checking the mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation and keep in your mind to ask the patient to go to a left lateral decubitus position and this make uh, accentuation of the memory. Then after that, you will go to the lower left bar sternal area. This is specific for tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, this area, I will uh, tell you now the areas and the, the places. Uh, this area in the uh, left force intercostal space near to the left upper sternum. Above it, the VSCD area. And uh, above that, you go to the pulmonary area for checking pulmonary hypertension and the pulmonary stenosis. Then the aortic area for aortic stenosis. Then the carotid bilaterally. Uh, you examine all this, uh, this area by the diaphragm and make the bill for apex and for the axilla and for the carotid. Okay, this is the uh, auscultation. After that, you finish the auscultation in the area of the apex, tricuspid area, uh, left upper sternal area, then pulmonary area, then aortic area, then the carotid area. Ask the patient to set up. And when the patient set up, you need to examine three things. Uh, firstly, examine the aortic area, which is called A2 area, or the specific area for aortic regurgitation, uh, and to check the back or lung base, if there is any uh, pulmonary edema or lung uh, congestion, and check the sacral edema, which is a manifestation of uh, right side uh, failure. Okay. I will tell you later as uh, aortic area two, this is uh, in uh, the uh, left third intercostal space near to the sternum. It is, it is not the aortic area, the the other aortic area they are for aortic stenosis, it is in the right second intercostal space. But this is for the aortic regurgitation. After you let the patient sit up and lean forward, you check the aortic regurgitation, making the patient sitting and leaning forward with full expiration. This is the best to augment the uh, murmur of aortic regurgitation. And auscultate the back for pulmonary congestion and sacral edema, putting your hand here. Uh, but also, don't forget to uh, ask uh, the patient for permission. If you have any pain in this area, I will press here and look to the eyes of the patient while you are pressing and check if there is beating edema in the sick or not. After that, you finish the exam and 
after that, you need to cover the patient and thank the patient with handshaking, wash your hand and look to the examiner and present your finding. And uh, you can ask for others I'd like to do blood pressure in those limbs, uh, capillary blood glucose for diabetes, urine, deep stick for proteinuria and bacteria, fundus examination for malignant hypertension. Uh, by this, you finish the uh, examination. This is a clinical video. I don't know to work here or I can, can send it to you. Uh, I'd like to take a voting if you can continue. If you want to take a rest, or you can resume after the rest. Because I will go to uh, details of the uh, theoretical issues for the examination. Continue, you can continue. Okay. Are you following me? Any anyone has any questions? Yes. Is it clear? Can you just explain the murmur of uh, mitral and radiating to axilla? For mitral regurgitation, you mean? Yes. Yeah. For, for mitral regurgitation, I mean we examine the, at the mitral area, which is the apex. The apex is the mitral area, located at the left fifth intercostal space at the medical vicular line. You put the stethoscope at this area, uh, and after that, in this area, you are searching for two things, either mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. So this is the important auscultation. When you put the stethoscope, you know what is this place, and I am searching for what. At apex, I am searching for mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. After I put the diaphragm, then to augment the murmur, I will uh, use the bell and make the patient lean forward and in the left lateral decubitus. This make augmentation of the mitral valve lesion, especially the mitral stenosis. Uh, it will appear at, as a mid-diastolic murmur, okay, with soft S1. This is characteristic of mitral stenosis. In mitral regurgitation, you will see band systolic murmur and radiating to the apex, you will move the stethoscope to the outside the apex, apex area to see if it is propagated to the axilla or not. Okay, is it clear? Okay, okay, yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Welcome. We'll mention that later also in the coming slides. Uh, okay. For heart murmur, what is the definition of murmur? Murmur, it means uh, turbulence in the blood flow. And it results either due to valve stenosis or regurgitation or a defect between the uh, two atriums, so uh, it receptal defect, or between the two ventricles, so ventricular septal defect, or between the uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery, it's called beta ductus arteriosus, or it may be a functional murmur. This is the cause of a murmur. So when you hear a murmur, you are searching for either stenotic valve or regurgitation of the valve or a defect ASCD, VSCD, or beta ductus arteriosus, or it may be a functional due to hyperdynamic circulation like in sepsis, cytosis, fever, pregnancy, make hyperdynamic circulation, or a functional murmur in case of a severe uh, heart failure, severe cardiomyopathy, there will be a dilatation of the mitral annulus and the tricuspid annulus and it make the uh, leaflets of the mitra and tracheal, but not uh, matched with each other, which is called a functional mitral regurgitation and a tra functional tracheal regurgitation in case of severe uh, cardinals. Uh, now I am speaking about the uh, theoretical issues for uh, cardiac examination. Okay, so just to make you follow me. Uh, for Identifying a murmur, we, class we classify the murmur either it is a systolic murmur or a diastolic murmur, okay, in relation to the cardiac cycle. And in, in the cardiac cycle, there is a systole and diastole. Um, if, if I make uh, like this, this is uh, like this is S1, and I make this. And we call this is uh, S2. Then again, S1. So this is the first heart sound, second heart sound. Okay. Uh, the first heart sound is responsible, 
يعني it, it come due to closure closure of the mitral valve or uh, uh, mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. So closure of the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve makes the S1. For second heart sound is due to closure of the aortic valve and pulmonary valve. This is S2. In between S1 and S2, this is the systole. This is the systole. And between the S2 and the, ne the next S1, this is the uh, diastole. So, uh, to make it easy, in the uh, systole here, systole and diastole, it means the left ventricle contraction. So, left ventricle contraction, if it's contracted, it's systole. If the left ventricle dilates, this is a diastole. Okay? Uh, the, the affection of uh, murmur is due to which valve is closed in this area, and which valve is opened, and which valve is closed here, and which valve is opened here. Okay, in systole, there is ventricular contraction, which means the ventricle is contract, so the blood is pushing from the ventricle to outside. If left ventricle, it will push from left ventricle to the aorta, right ventricle from right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation. So at systole, the, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve are open, while mitral valve and the tricuspid valve are closed. This is very important so that you can know why the uh, Systolic murmur here is will be due to either aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis. So the flow of the blood in in in, in these valves uh, uh, stenotic, so the murmur is appear, or uh, due to the closed valve, which is the mitral and the tricuspid, should be closed. There is a leak of mitral and the tricuspid, so uh, there is uh, systolic murmur due to mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation. Okay. The opposite is here. In diastole, there is relaxation of the ventricles, so uh, making the uh, venous return. At that time, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve are closed. In diastole, aortic valve and the pulmonary valve is closed, but the mitral and the tricuspid is open, so to allow the blood from atrium going to the ventricles. So any murmurs during a diastole, it may be either either due to problem in the open valve or leak of the closed valve. Here in diastole, in diastole, the mitral and tricuspid are open. So uh, any stenosis in these valves, stenosis, mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, will lead to diastolic murmur. And also as well as the closed valve and the diastole, which is the pulmonary valves and aortic valves should be closed here. If there is any leakage, leakage of these valves, it will lead to murmur, which is called diastolic murmur. I mean in aortic regurgitation or pulmonary uh, regurgitation. I hope this slide you know, to be clear because this is the concept of the, the next type of murmurs. Is it clear? Are you following me? Hello? Hello, yes. Hello. Yes, hello. Are you following me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so now if we speak about systolic murmur, it will be uh, aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, or mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, if we speak about diastolic murmur, we will speak about uh, mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis and aortic regurgitation, pulmonary regurgitation. Okay, uh, for any murmur, for any murmur, try to uh, know these six items. Where is this murmur? What is the location of the murmur? Because each location denotes a specific valve lesion. So where is the murmur? What is the timing of the murmur? Is it in systole or diastole? And what is the characteristic of this murmur? Is it has any specific character, like uh, band systolic murmur, or early uh, diastolic murmur, or mid diastolic murmur? Or this is a specific character of the murmur. 
and if this minimal is radiating to any specific part, we will speak about each uh, item separately, but just to know, yani, uh, characteristic like, as I mentioned to you, uh, in systolic murmur, we have uh, pan systolic murmur. This is specific for mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and uh, DSCD. It's called pan systolic murmur. Okay, some murmurs are uh, ejection systolic murmur, like in aortic stenosis, there is ejection systolic murmur. It's called crescento, decrescento, diamond shaped murmur. This is ejection systolic murmur of aortic stenosis. Uh, in aortic regurgitation, it is called early diastolic murmur. Okay, so this is characteristic of the murmur. Radiation, some murmurs are radiate to other parts like mitral regurgitation, radiating to the axilla. Uh, DSCD is radiating to all over the pericordium. Uh, aortic stenosis is radiating to the carotids. Okay. Uh, and the breathing effect. The breathing effect has effect on the murmur. It accentuates some murmur and decreases some murmur. Simply by inspiration, any inspiration, it accentuates the murmur of the right side of the heart. Why? Because when you make inspiration, you increase the negative interspersic pressure, so you encourage the venous return to be gush inside the heart. So venous return is coming from the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, going to the uh, right atrium, and from the right atrium to the right ventricle, and from the right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation. So any lesion here regarding the Tricuspid or the pulmonary, it will be accentuated by inspiration. So inspiration accentuates the right side, uh, uh, right side of uh, in any right-sided heart lesion will be accentuated by inspiration, like tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary valve lesion increased by inspiration. Uh, also, the patient position. Try to put the patient position to accentuate the murmur. As we will see later, the uh, mitral valve lesion, mitral stenosis or, or the mitral regurgitation, accentuated by let the patient go uh, to the uh, left lateral position. Okay, in aortic regurgitation, accentuated when the aortic valve is near the chest, so let the patient sit up, leaning forward, and with full expiration, so accentuate the aortic region to the sternum. So this is the effect of the change of the patient position. So you. See the site of the murmur, timing, characteristic, radiation, breathing effect, patient position. Okay. Regarding the timing, we mentioned now about the systolic murmur and diastolic. Okay. Uh, the systolic murmur, the most important that I put in black, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and BSD. And all the three is called pan systolic murmur or hollow systolic murmur. Take the old systolic. The whole duration of the stone by mitral gauge or tricuspid gauge or this. You take the whole stone. This is called pan systolic Okay. Uh, the mitral valve collapse is can be considered as a sub part of mitral regurgitation because uh, we will know the mitral valve collapse is a, a, a systolic murmur also, but it is preceded by a mid ejection click, then late systolic murmur. So it is uh, some sort of mitral regurgitation, but the most commonly come in the exam, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, DSCD, this band systolic murmur. Regarding the ejection systolic murmur, we have three. Most important is aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis and aortic sclerosis and hookup. The three is ejection systolic murmur at the aortic area. Okay, we will know the difference between these three and these three later. Okay, but now, Put in your mind, this is systolic murmur, ejection systolic, and this is systolic murmur, pan systolic. Okay. For diastolic murmur, the most important is uh, mitral stenosis and aortic uh, regurgitation. We mentioned before the mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, or aortic regurgitation, pulmonary regurgitation, but the most commonly coming in practice is mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation. This is the uh, diastolic murmurs. Okay. Let's go to the characteristic of each murmur, as I mentioned to you. Uh, you categorize it either band systolic murmur, ejection systolic murmur. This is for the systolic. This slide is like this slide. And I put the systo band systolic and the ejection systolic with each other. And the diastolic, especially mitral stenosis 
and aortic regurgitation, but with some data. Pan-systolic mitrostenosis, sorry, mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation or uh, VSD. This is what's called pan-systolic murmur, okay? Uh, ejection systolic murmur is aortic stenosis or aortic sclerosis or hookup. This ejection systolic murmur, right? You feel like ejection systolic murmur is coming abruptly and go down abruptly, making a diamond, diamond shape. Uh, this is called uh, uh, ejection systolic murmur. Early diastolic, in case of aortic uh, regurgitation, is in the early diastole. And mid diastolic rumbling murmur with pre systolic accentuation, this is very characteristic of mitrostenosis. Mid diastolic and rumbling in character, where followed by pre systolic accentuation with soft S1. This is mitrostenosis. I will um, draw something here. Okay. Okay. Show me that this is S1 and this is S2 and this is another S1. Okay, this is S1. This is S2. This is again S1. This is a systole and this is the diastole. Normally, the diastole is wider than the systole. Pan systolic murmur, it means that the murmur is coming from the S1 to S2 all over like this. This is pan systolic murmur. All the system this is band systolic. Okay, in mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, VC. Ejection systolic murmur, it means like this. It's called crescento, decrescento murmur. It's make it like a diamond shape. It means that the murmur is started slowly, then becoming uh, take its peak, then after that uh, decrease, try to bunch it. But it is take all the Systole also, but in the form of ejection systolic murmur. So there is a peak in the middle of the system. This is called ejection systolic murmur. This is called pan systolic murmur. In the diastolic murmur, early diastolic here in the early diastole, there is the aortic regurgitation. After the S2, immediately small like this. It's very soft murmur, and easily to miss, and it needs the yeah, special technique, like you make the patient to lean forward and uh, uh, hold uh, breathing at expiration is aortic regurgitation. Very soft, early diastolic murmur, very soft, easily to miss. And the uh, mitral uh, stenosis, it is a uh, uh, mid diastole rumbling murmur, like here, start in the mid diastole, and it starts small. Then, after that, accentuate, 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 and the pre S1, it is. Accentuated, it's called the pre systolic accentuation. Okay, this is roughly the murmur. Definitely, the diastolic murmur is yani, difficult to, to hear or need a lot of effort, but the systolic murmur is most common and most easy to get. Okay, after that, uh, the band systolic murmur, as we mentioned, it is mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, VSD. How can we differentiate this uh, band systolic murmur? by the specific character of each member. Like what? Like in mitral regurgitation, it is the site of uh, mitral regurgitation to be in the mitral area, and it is radiated to the axilla and increase with expiration. Okay? So the site is mitral area, because mitral is a mitral. Radiate to the axilla, the specific for mitral regurgitation, and increase with expiration. As we mentioned before, any right side heart lesion increase with inspiration. Any left side of heart lesion will be increased by Expiration. For tricuspid regurgitation, it will be in the uh, tricuspid area and it is not radiated to the axilla. And on the opposite here, it is increased by inspiration. This is very characteristic of tricuspid regurgitation, increased by inspiration because it is in the right side of the heart. VSD is also a pan systolic murmur. It is at the lower sternal edge and it propagates to all over the precordium. You can hear the VSD all over the uh, Precordium. Okay, this is the difference between the band systolic type. 
what is the difference between uh, aortic stenosis and uh, aortic sclerosis? We mentioned before that both are ejection systolic murmur. Am I right? Yes. Aortic stenosis and aortic sclerosis is ejection systolic murmur. But the difference is uh, you can hear it in the aortic area. Okay. But aortic stenosis, there is low pulse volume. It radiates to the carotids. You might find a thrill if the aortic stenosis is severe. Okay. On the other hand, aortic sclerosis is a normal pulse volume and it is not radiating and there is no thrill. So it is considered as a benign condition. Sometimes uh, you can see in the elderly patient. Okay. So this is the difference between aortic stenosis and aortic sclerosis. What is the difference between aortic stenosis and hookum? We mentioned before that aortic stenosis, aortic sclerosis, and hookum, the three are ejection systolic murmur. What is the difference between aortic stenosis and hookum? Aortic stenosis is an ejection systolic murmur of the aortic area and it radiates to the carotid. Okay, this is the specific character of the aortic stenosis. But in hookum, you will have uh, uh, three things. Number one, there is a murmur of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Because there is thickening in the left ventricle, there is thickening here. In the left ventricle outflow tract, there is thickening. So uh, you will feel an uh, ejection systolic murmur at uh, the lower left sternal edge. It radiates to the sternal uh, edge, but not radiate to the carotid. So hookum is not radiate to the carotid, and it accentuated by standing from squatting position and by valsalva maneuver. It's very important. And there is what's called the same systolic anterior motion of the uh, mitral valve. It reflects a uh, mimic murmur like mitral regurgitation, which is a band systolic murmur as the apex radiate to the axilla. So, this is the difference between aortic stenosis and hookum. Hookum, so it is a murmur of left ventricular outflow tract, not a murmur of a valve lesion. It is a problem in the outflow tract itself, and it accentuated by standing from squatting position. It's the patient sitting, squatting, and stand abruptly or by, by, val, by valsalva. And there is a murmur mimic the mitral regurgitation. And systolic murmur at the apex radiate to the axilla. Uh, what about the other features of any murmur? The radiation. We will come now to the radiation. The most important murmurs for radiation is aortic stenosis radiate to the carotid and to the neck, mitral regurgitation radiating to the axilla. Aortic regurgitation, it uh, radiate or you can listen it in the A2 area, which is the left third intercostal space and the uh, sternal border. VSD is propagated all over the pericardium. Band systolic murmur propagated all over the pericardium. This is the radiation. Regarding the effect of breathing, uh, as we mentioned before, any murmur uh, you do in inspiration you accentuate the right-sided part vision, especially the tricuspid band. And in, uh, during expiration, you accentuate the left-sided heart region like mitral regurgitation or aortic uh, regurgitation. Because, as I mentioned to you, during expiration, you increase the venous return, so you augment the murmur uh, and the blood flow running on the right side of the heart. And the opposite will happen with the expiration. What about the effect of the patient position? If, if any different, yes. You try to accentuate the murmur by changing the patient position. Uh, in uh, left lateral position, it is uh, to augment the uh, mitral valve lesion, the apex area, by left lateral position, special mitral nose mitral regurgitation. And the aortic area is augmented by with the patient sitting up leaning forward slightly to the left side at the end of expiration. This is a specific maneuver you need to do for augment the aortic regurgitation. This is the position by picture to make it facilitate for you. Here you lead the patient to go to the left side of the body and you check the mitral area by the bill. Now check by the bill. And here you lead the patient leaning forward, sitting up, and you put the stethoscope at the uh, left uh, uh, left third intercostal space. This is aortic area. It's called A2 area. The aortic area, first aortic area here, right second intercostal space, and the pulmonary area here, 
left second intercostal ribs. The A2 area or the area for aortic regurgitation is here, left third intercostal space. Okay. طيب, when we use the bell and the frame, it is يعني, high pitched murmur, we use the bell frame, while the low pitched murmur, you use the bell. Especially, as I mentioned to you, the bell is good for checking the carotids and the axilla and the mitral valve area. Okay. High pitched murmur like pansystolic murmur, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, BSCD, all this can be examined by the effect. Although some authors, some authors and some books read that you have to check all the areas, all valvular area by the frame, then follow it by the bill. But this is a time consuming and effort consuming, which will give you, uh, will not give you a valid uh, information. Enough for you to use the uh, diaphragm and emphasize using the bill in the uh, mitral area and in the aortic area and the carotids. Okay. But now we'll come to the site of the murmur, where to lessen the site of murmur. Okay. Uh, here, this is the uh, chest wall. This is the sternum, and this is the body of the sternum, and this is the fluid process. The junction here is called manubrium sternum. Manubrium sternum, if you put your finger here and go to the lateral side, either to right or left, you will feel a, a, a space. This is space is the second space. So this is second space left side, this is second space right side. The left second intercostal space just near to the sternum, this is this is called a pulmonic area. Okay. The right second intercostal space, right second intercostal space near to the sternum, this is called aortic area. Okay. And here is the mitral area, it's located at the apex, which is in the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicle. This is the center of the clavicle, mid-clavicle line, and in the fifth intercostal space, this is the apex. The definition of the apex is the outermost and the lowermost pulsation you can feel. So you put your hand, outermost, lowermost pulsation, this is the apex. Normally located at the left, fifth intercostal space at mid-clavicular line. Okay, the tricuspid area is in the fourth intercostal space. So this is in the fifth, this is in the fourth intercostal space. So we are dealing with two, then two, two right and two left, and here's the fourth, here is the fifth. Okay, the VSD area is, yeah, we can say that this is the area above the tricuspid valve, this is the VSD area, but you will see that it's propagated all over the precordium, but this is the maximum intensity will be here. So you will start your stethoscope here in the mitral area, putting the diaphragm, checking the mitral stenosis or mitral regression. Then ask the patient to go to left lateral position and turn the bell and check here uh, for the propagation if it's mitral regurgitation or accentuation of the murmur uh, by doing the patient in the left lateral position to hear the mitral stenosis will by the mid diastolic crumbling murmur, pre systolic accentuation and soft S1, characteristic of mitral stenosis. Or mitral regurgitation, pan systolic murmur prob uh, propagated to the axil. Here, the, then after you finish the apex, go to the scope to the tricuspid area. Put your stethoscope here, try to listen to the tricuspid valve, tricuspid regurgitation. Ask the patient to take deep breath so you augment the tricuspid regurgitation here, especially if you are searching for pulmonary hypertension. Then go up one space here for VSD, pan systolic murmur also. Then go here for the uh, pulmonary area, then go here in the aortic area, and then go here is the carotid right and the carotid left. And when you let the patient sit and uh, leaning forward, you can check the aortic area, A2 area, which is located here for aortic regurgitation. So this is the size of valve. If you are searching for mitral valve disease, go to the apex. If you are searching for aortic valve disease, go to the uh, aortic area. If you are searching for the pulmonary, go to the pulmonary area. If you are searching for tricuspid valve, go to the tricuspid valve. So this is the importance of the region of the valves. Okay. Are you following me? Yes. Yes, we are. Yes, doctor. Okay, good. I hope that you are not getting uh, any. Uh, 
a board or something like this? It's, no, no, it's useful. Uh, it's uh, useful information. After we finish these slides, uh, I'd like to emphasize on you, do not do like this in the exam. I know we can do like this in our real life, especially in some uh, Arabian area or some like this, we can do like this. But in exam, it is completely forbidden and some candidate take a comment by this. He is examining the patient over the clothes. Don't do them over the clothes like this, over the gown, over the bra. I put the scope inside the t-shirt. All this is not allowed. You have to put the scope in the side exactly what. What if this is a female? Uh, look, Yanni, uh, usually in the exams, uh, outside in UK or in Malta or in something like this, they bring the patient is uh, exposed or nearly exposed. You wear a gown, and below the gown, there is no any under clothes. So when you move the gown, you can expose all the In females, they keep the bra for keeping the patient to fear, but at least do not put the stethoscope like here. Put the stethoscope down here and in the area, and try by the other hand, can elevate the breast, just to يعني, maintain the patient to fear, and also at the same time, put the stethoscope on the skin. It is not preferable to put the stethoscope on the clothes, because some friction sound will happen and it will make conflict for you. Okay? Okay. Then for uh, heart sounds, uh, we speak about S1, S2. This is the most important uh, heart sound, S1 and S2. As we mentioned before, S1 is due to closure of the mitral and tracuspid valves. S2 is due to closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves. Okay? When S1 is start, it means closure of mitral and tricuspid, and the opening of the other it means the ob opening of the aortic and the pulmonary valve is opened here, and this is a start of the systole and the cardiac output will be doing left ventricle to the aorta, right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation. Okay. On the other side, for the uh, S2 second heart cell, it's caused by closure of the aortic and the pulmonary valve. So any lesion of aortic pulmonary valve, it will affect the S2. At that time of closure of aortic and the pulmonary valve, there is opening of the other. There is opening of mitral and tricuspid valve, and this is the time of the filling. This is a time of the uh, the stool of the heart. Okay. Here, uh, just kindly note that in S1, it is coincide with the carotid box. So when you put your finger on the patient carotid and your stethoscope in the chest, the pulse which is coincide with your finger on the carotid, this is S1. So you can divide the murmur or divide the lesion of S1 and S2. The lesion that you hear coincide with S1 with the carotid pulse, this is for S1. The other one is abnormality in S2. This is the importance of putting your finger on the carotid uh, or the patient, but not put long time. I mean, five seconds and remove, and another five seconds and remove like this. Do not let the patient yeah, you get uh, get trouble or get uh, fatigued by this. The other uh, important information for second heart sound is not a single sound. It is not a single sound. It is uh, two sounds, it's A2, B2. Uh, this is normally happening, but it happen in circumstances like a patient to be young, below 30 years, and you are using a bill, and you're putting the bill in pulmonary area, and ask the patient to take deep inspiration. So when you ask the patient to take deep inspiration, you make the venous return coming to the uh, right atrium and from right atrium to the right ventricle and from right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation. So in the, here's the pulmonary valve, here's the uh, tricuspid valve, this is the right side of the heart. So when the blood go more in the right atrium and from right atrium to right ventricle and from right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation, it will take long time long time for pulmonary valve to close. So the aortic valve will close firstly, and the pulmonary valve will close a little bit later, so that you will feel that it is a double click. So actually the S2 is a two sounds, aortic and pulmonary. Okay. 
Okay. Let's speak about S1 uh, with more details. S1, as we mentioned, is due to closure of the mitral valve and tricuspid valve. So we can say this is normal S1 or this is soft S1 or this is accentuated S1. Normal S1, this is a normal. Soft S1 is a specific of uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. And accentuated S1 is this specific, it is a specific for mitral stenosis. Okay? So when you mention uh, the diagnosis of mitral stenosis, you say that this is a mid diastolic rumbling murmur, pre systolic accentuation with soft S1 and located at the apex area, which is the left fifth intercostal space at mid clavicular line. Okay? This is mitral stenosis. Mitral regurgitation, there is a pan systolic murmur. Okay, radiating to the axilla with soft S1. Okay. What about S2? S2, we have either soft S2 or reverse splitting of S2 or loud pulmonary component of S2 or wide splitting of S2. Uh, normal S2, this is a normal. The soft S2, it can appear in aortic stenosis and aortic regression because there is a conflict between some and doctors say that aortic stenosis uh, make uh, accentuated S2. No, aortic stenosis, there is soft S2. Aortic regurgitation, also soft S2. So soft S2 in case aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Okay. What about reverse splitting of S2? Reverse splitting, it means, as we mentioned before, the S2 composed of A, A2, yani the, the, the aortic component of second heart sound, and the pulmonary component of the second heart sound, A2 and B2. There is a space between them, okay? How to make this space is longer, or make it uh, wide, by making the uh, pulmonary area is uh, stenotic, like in, uh, in, 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 in pulmonary, Stenosis or in our uh, atrial septal defect, there is an effect between the left atrium and right atrium. So the blood go through the left atrium to the right atrium, and from the right atrium to the right vent ventricle, then to the pulmonary circulation. So this makes the pulmonary valve take long time to close. So it be a wide gap here. So it's called wide splitting of S2. Okay. Uh, this is wide splitting. In reverse splitting, it means that the opposite, the aortic area is coming here and the pulmonary area is coming here. It means that the pulmonary closure is first or coming before the aortic closure. This will happen in reverse splitting of S2. It means that there is severe aortic stenosis or in case of focum. So the uh, pulmonary closure coming too early before the aortic valve has to be closed. Okay, that's what what's meant by reverse splitting of S2 and wide splitting of S2. In uh, wide splitting of S2, there is a term called wide fixed splitting. In, S, in ASCD, it is wide fixed splitting all over, it means during inspiration or expiration. But in pulmonary stenosis, it is wide splitting during the uh, inspiration only because you increase the blood flow to the pulmonary uh, valve, so it will take a uh, long, uh, long time. Okay, so why it fixes splitting characteristic of AC? So I put here two brackets to be matched with AC. Why it fixes splitting of S2 with AC, but why it's splitting of S2 only? This is pulmonary stenosis. Okay, reverse splitting with UCAM or aortic stenosis to make the aortic valve delayed. And lastly, the uh, loud pulmonary component of S2 is a sign of pulmonary hypertension. Loud pulmonary component of S2. Again, we'll collect all the signs of pulmonary hypertension in one slide later, okay? But remember, signs of pulmonary hypertension, we mentioned before, left of our sternal heave, left of our sternal thrill, uh, palpable pulmonary component of second heart sound, and here, loud pulmonary component of the second heart sound, okay? This is for S2.
this is the same slide as before, but the previous was in a different. What is the signs of congestive heart failure? I mentioned to you before in the comment, final comment of cardiology, plus or minus, you have to mention plus or minus, patient has no manifestation of congestive heart failure, the patient has no clinical manifestation of pulmonary hypertension, the patient has no peripheral stigmata of protective endocarditis. These three negatives is very important to be mentioned in any cardiac examination presentation. So what is signs of congestive heart failure? Uh, we have right-sided and left-sided, and uh, put in your mind that the patient which you face in the exam is a not a yani, patient that you see in ER or ICU or CCU. Yani, it's taking the diuretics and the heart failure signs it will be minimal. So you have to uh, make a good effort to elicit minimal uh, beadal edema, minimal sacral edema, end in respiratory crepitation. So you have to Big, do some effort to search for it. Uh, for lung congestion, which is end in spiratory crepitation, this is the surest sign of left ventricular failure, of pulmonary edema or pulmonary congestion. The other are manifestation of right side of heart failure. From elevated GVB or congestive tender hepatomegaly, you feel that liver is not good. The, the liver is enlarged and congested and it's tender. Very important because it's con congested liver. Also, ascites, uh, scrotal edema, in male, sacral edema, lower limb edema. All this is a manifestation of right-sided heart failure. Okay. You can find the patient with both biventricular failure, so you can find all manifestation of right-sided heart failure plus bilateral basal crepitation. Or you can find only bilateral basal crepitation, so it means that this is left ventricular failure and no right side uh, heart failure, okay? Right. Now we come to the uh, signs of uh, pulmonary hypertension. What is the signs of pulmonary hypertension? This is a collection of all the signs. Firstly, there is elevation of the GVB. You mentioned how many centimeter water, and you can see the uh, giant V wave, denoting tricuspid regurgitation, okay? Then, Left parasternal heave, and I, I mentioned to you the heave is due to pressure over, or left parasternal thrill is due to functional tricuspid regurgitation. So left parasternal heave, left parasternal thrill, and palpable pulmonary component of the second heart sound over the pulmonary area, and loud pulmonary component of the second heart sound over the pulmonary area. So elevated GVB, left parasternal heave, left parasternal thrill, Palpa pulmonary component of second heart sound and loud pulmonary component of second heart sound. And there is uh, two murmurs, one called Graham steel murmur. What's Graham steel murmur? Graham steel murmur is due to pulmonary regurgitation. Uh, it is like aortic regurgitation, early, soft, early diastolic murmur uh, in the pulmonary area at the left sternal edge. Also, the patient is sitting and leaning forward at the inspiration. Okay, this is called the Graham steel murmur. It is a pulmonary regurgitation murmur. It is uh, due to increase the pulmonary circulation and uh, the uh, pulmonary pressure and the pulmonary circulation is increased. So it uh, make a murmur of pulmonary regurgitation. Uh, also functional tricuspid regurgitation, which is band systolic murmur at the uh, at the same site of tricuspid area, it's called a Carvello sign. Okay, plus or minus, you can see the bilateral basal fine crepitation in the lung and lower limb edema. Okay, Now we finished the uh, examination and the uh, most important finding. We'll go now to the details of each uh, murmurs. And I put it in the comparison to make it easy. Yani aortic stenosis with aortic regurgitation, and another table for mitral stenosis and the mitral regurgitation, and another table for uh, VSCD and ACD. Although ACD is not frequently coming, but I put it away for clarification.
uh, in aortic stenosis and aortic reflusion, the comparison or the finding of each murmur, as we mentioned before, I think you can now uh, yani collect the data. How can you say the patient aortic stenosis? You will find ejection systolic murmur, crescento to crescento murmur, the diamond shape, the one we, we mentioned before. This is S1 and this is S2 and this is another S1 and this is a diamond murmur, crescento, decrescento murmur. This is aortic stenosis, crescento, decrescento, diamond shape, and it is uh, appear in the aortic area and radiate to the carotid. And you'll find the S2 will be soft S2. Okay. Uh, the apex, it will be uh, non displaced and heaving because there's pressure overload. Pressure overload. So, mostly this is left ventricular hypertrophy, so it will make a leaving, a heaving apex. Okay. Uh, plus or minus, you can uh, found a, a thrill. Okay. Uh, in the pulse of aortic stenosis, you will find slow rising pulse, low volume, because there is no pulse suppression, there is no difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And at the neck, you will see propagated the murmur to the neck, and you can see a systolic thrill at the aortic area. This is the aortic stenosis. So, ejection systolic murmur, crescendo, decrescendo, soft S2, uh, the apex is uh, non displaced, heaving apex, slow rising pulse when you catch the pulse firstly. And the neck, you plus or minus, you can see as a systolic thrill. In aortic regurgitation, it is a soft early diastolic murmur. This is S1, this is S2, this is again S1. The murmur will be here. Soft early diastolic, just in, at early diastolic. Soft early diastolic murmur at the aortic area, the A2, which is in the left. Uh, Left upper sternal edge and the third intercostal space. Also, we will find soft S2, as I mentioned to, to you before. The S2 is soft in both aortic and aortic regurgitation. And uh, in aortic regurgitation, there is uh, will be the apex is thrusting apex, hyperdynamic because it's hyperdynamic circulation. And definitely, the pulse is very characteristic collapsing pulse. It's called water hammer pulse because there is large. A wide space between systolic and diastolic blood pressure, so it's collapsing water hammer pulse, and you might see a visible carotid pulse. This is very important when you explain or demonstrate uh, a murmur of aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. Okay, in aortic regurgitation, uh, added on this, you will find what's called a peripheral signs in aortic regurgitation. There is a specific peripheral signs in aortic regurgitation, it will help you to see. That this is uh, our technology. Uh, it is uh, many names of yani, scientists, but you have to know the idea. Corrigan sign that you see the carotid is pulsating. The carotid pulse is pulsating, visible pulsation is a carotid, it's called Corrigan sign. Demoset sign, it's you see a head nodding. The head of the patient is nodding because the pulse is making the head is move like moving of the head with the pulse. This is a demoset sign. Uh, quink sign, this is when you see the nail of the patient and you make a gentle pressure on the nail, like you're checking the capillary refill. Uh, by this gentle pressure, you will feel pulsation under the nail. You will feel there is pulsation under the nail. Other sign is the Drosé sign. Drosé sign and pistol shot sign, the trope sign. This is in the femoral area. You put the stethoscope. Either you feel a murmur, this is called a the sign, or you uh, listen to a pistol shot, like shot, like a pistol shot. It's called a uh, trope sign. So in our technical regurgitation, is very important. You put the stethoscope at the groin of the patient. Okay. Uh, another sign is called molar sign. It is the uvula. Uh, if you ask the patient to open and check the uvula, you feel the uvula is uh, pulsating and moving with the with the pulse. Okay. This is called the peripheral signs of aortic. Uh, regurgitations. This is the uh, details as we mentioned before Corrigan sign and Demoset sign, head nodding, pink sign, the pulsation in the nail, and uh, the rosé sign and the pistol shot from the femoral, and the molar sign, the uvula pulsation. Okay. okay. Uh, in aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, uh, you need to say uh, and Think about differential diagnosis. What differential diagnosis of aortic stenosis? What differential diagnosis of aortic regurgitation? 
Aortic stenosis is an ejection systolic nerve. So you mentioned the other cause of ejection systolic nerve, aortic sclerosis, hookum, VCD, because it's band systolic nerve, okay? Or any high flow in aortic tract like high cardiac output or anemia or pregnancy. So this is a differential diagnosis of aortic stenosis. Uh, because, you know, in the exam, I will tell you this later, uh, what, what is required from you. Number one, to do the clinical examination frequently and to, number two, say the uh, both the finding and then diagnosis, differential diagnosis, investigation and the treatment. And you might be asked by some other question like causes, like the difference between something and something like this. This is the examiner questions. So in aortic stenosis, definitely will ask you what is differential diagnosis of this minor, so other systolic minor. In aortic regurgitation, the differential diagnosis of a collapsing minor, which is maybe severe mitral regurgitation or patent ductus arteriosus, or any hyperdynamic circulation like fever, anemia, cytotoxicosis, pregnancy, arteriovenous fistula and renal failure, budget disease, because it make high cardiac output heart failure. Okay. Uh, the uh, causes of aortic stenosis and the causing causes of aortic regurgitation to easily memorize aortic stenosis either. Uh, patient is young, so it's by cause of aortic. Patient is elderly, so it's may a sclerotic aortic. Or it may be a congenital. Congenital, it means either. This is a lesion of the valve itself, by cause of aortic valve or sclerotic aortic valve. In congenital, there is a subvalvular or supravalve. It means below the valve or above the valve. Above the valve, it's a William disease, stenosis above the valve, or subvalvular aortic stenosis, it is a hookum, which is a thickening in the left ventricular outflow tract. So this is the cause of aortic stenosis. What, is the, what are the causes of aortic regurgitation? Acute or chronic. In acute, in aortic dissection or infective endocarditis or trauma. Okay. In chronic aortic regurgitation, especially in the Turner syndrome or Rheumat uh, rheumatological diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis, the seronegative spontaneous arthritis, Reiter syndrome, Takayasu arthritis, all these rheumatological diseases causing aortic regurgitation. Or it may be a connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome, Ehler Danlos syndrome, Pseudosensoma elasticum, osteogenesis imperfecta. So this is the cause of chronic aortic regurgitation. Just to you know, try to study it and to make it uh, as easy to memorize for you, so to so to help you to uh, rapid uh, reply in the group. Lastly, uh, the clinical signs of severity of each nerve, the clinical signs of severity of aortic stenosis, clinical signs of severity of aortic regurgitation. Simply, it is an augmentation of the nerve. Like aortic stenosis, there is narrow pulse pressure. The difference between the systolic and diastolic is narrow. So this is a sign of severity of aortic stenosis. Slow rising pulse for the same cause. The stool and the stool is near each other due to aortic stenosis. So the cardiac output is little. So the systolic blood pressure is little. So this slow rising pulse. This is low pulse volume. When you examine the pulse by hand, pulse volume is low. There is manifestation of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, heaving apex. Okay. There is a thrill, as we mentioned before. The thrill is a, is a sign of uh, palpable murmur, so it's a severity of the murmur, and it will be in a systole because the aortic is in a systolic murmur, so systolic thrill. Soft S2 is to becoming soft in aortic stenosis, and if the aortic stenosis become more and more, there is a reverse splitting of S2, as you mentioned before, the aortic component of the S2 will, uh, will be delayed, so the pulmonary part will be coming firstly, so it's called reverse splitting of pulmonary pulmonary coming first in our coming, so it's called reverse rating of S2. Finally, the S4 and uh, the late systolic peaking of a long murmur, there is murmur becoming long. And finally, this too is common in each murmurs, like signs of pulmonary hypertension, signs of left ventricular hypertension. You can you know, study three or four of these, it will be more than enough. For aortic regurgitation, it is the same, augmentation of the murmur. It's wide pulse pressure. The difference between systolic and diastolic is very wide. So the collapsing pulse it will be more obvious. The duration will be more longer in time. There is S3. There is what's called Austin Flint murmur. Austin Flint murmur, this is a functional 
amitriostenosis murmur. It is like amitriostenosis murmur. It is a sign of severity of aortic regurgitation, uh, soft, uh, low pitch, mid diastolic rumbling murmur at the apex, like the amitriostenosis. Uh, and we, يعني, يعني, you hear in aortic regurgitation a murmur at the apex like mitrostenosis. So we get confused. This is not mitrostenosis. This is a called Austin Flint murmur. It's a functional mitral stenosis, okay, uh, in case of severe aortic uh, regurgitation, okay. And also, definitely, the uh, peripheral signs of aortic regurgitation, as we mentioned before, uh, head nodding and the uh, pistol shot and the uh, corrigan sign. And also the signs of pulmonary hypertension, signs of left ventricular fibrillation. You will see here that signs of pulmonary hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy in both. Okay. This is regarding aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. We can shift to the mitral valve, mitral stenosis, and mitral regurgitation. What is the characteristic of mitral stenosis? Mitral stenosis is with a mid diastolic rumbling murmur with pre-systolic accentuation and preceded by an uh, opening snap. It's called an uh, opening snap. Loudest in expiration. Loudest in expiration because as we mentioned, the, any mitral it is left-sided, so in expiration it will be loud. Mitral snows or mitral regurgitation. And it will be augmented when the patient in the left lateral cubitus, here and here. And the better to listen to it by the bell, okay? And uh, remember that mostly you can find uh, plus or minus atrial fibrillation, especially in the mitral valve uh, disease, because most common uh, cause is atrial fibrillation with mitral valve lesions. And the plus or minus the signs of hypertension in the form of uh, malar rash, right by sternal heave, light by sternal thrill, Graham steel murmur, which is a pulmonary vegetation, as we mentioned before. This is a description of the mitral stenosis. Uh, mid diastolic rumbling murmur, pre systolic accentuation at the left fifth center, left fifth center costal space, mid clavicular line, loudest with expiration, and augmented in the patient in left lateral position. Plus or minus there is AF, plus or minus there is pulmonary hypertension. This is mitral stenosis. You will find the S1 is accentuated. Okay. Uh, with mitral stenosis, S1 is accentuated. It can be soft only if there's calcification of the mitral valve. If there's calcification, it will be soft, or if it is mixed, mixed mitral stenosis and the mitral regurgitation, so it will be S1 soft. But the routine is there's accentuation of S1. Also, put in your mind, if you find AF, mention that it is a variable S1, variable S1, okay? It's a variable S1. In uh, apex of the mitral stenosis, it is called a tabbing apex. It's a palpable S1. Palpable S1, and the apex is not displaced, and there is uh, no uh, thrill. And pulse, it may be uh, low volume or plus or minus atrial fibrillation. Low volume because it is uh, some sort of low cardiac output because mitral stenosis, the aortic stenosis is a uh, uh, cardiac output for the, for the patient. So this is a typical a description of mitral stenosis. What is the description of mitral regurgitation? It is a band systolic murmur located at the apex, it's a mitral area, and radiated to the axilla, and it is loudest on expiration. The same, okay? Associated with soft S1. In mitral stenosis, accentuated S1. In mitral regurgitation, it's soft S1. Regarding apex, there is left ventricular hypertrophy, so it will be displaced and thrusting apex, hyperdynamic, systolic thrill can be present. It is a manifestation of mitral regurgitation and a severity of mitral regurgitation. Okay. Uh, regarding differential diagnosis of mitral stenosis, what is the common cause of mitral stenosis? Is a rheumatic fever, rheumatic fever, rheumatic fever. So rheumatic heart disease is the most common cause of mitral stenosis. Then after that, other causes like congenital mitral stenosis, or left atrial myxoma, or mucopolysaccharidosis, or some rheumatological diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or SLE, or carcinoid syndrome. 
cause of mitral regurgitation, either acute or chronic. Acute, as you mentioned before in aortic regurgitation, it looks similar. Infective endocarditis or ruptured of core tendini or babillary muscle, especially after myocardial infarction, or trauma, traumatic. Okay, this is acute cause of mitral regurgitation. Chronic cause of mitral regurgitation, mitral valve uh, prolapse or cardiomyopathy, as you mentioned before, the functional mitral regurgitation or functional tricuspid regurgitation in severely dilated uh, uh, ventricle. Maybe rheumatic heart disease, maybe also some rheumatological diseases or connective tissue diseases like Marfan, uh, Susan Soma, Elasticum, Ehler, Danlos syndrome, Osteogenes imperfecta. There is elasticity of the connective tissues and make affect the valve to make mitral regurgitation. Clinical signs of severity of mitral stenosis is the uh, uh, opening snap becoming early. The opening snap is the opening of the mitral valve. So start the opening as early as uh, before the murmur. It's a sign of severity of mitral stenosis. Also, the length of murmur increased. The same two most common causes, the uh, signs of pulmonary hypertension, signs of ventricular hypertrophy, and low pulse pressure, it means the cardiac output is affected by this severe mitral stenosis. This is a clinical sign of severity of mitral stenosis. In mitral regurgitation, the signs of severity is the systolic serrel. There is serrel at the apex. There is signs of pulmonary hypertension, as we mentioned before. And it will be here, the tricuspid regurgitation para, uh, parasternal thrill. So you will have two thrill. Thrill at the apex, this thrill of the mitral regurgitation, and other thrill of tricuspid regurgitation. This is called precordial thrill. Precordial thrill means apex thrill and the parasternal thrill. This is double thrill in case of mitral regurgitation. Okay. Plus also signs of left ventricular hypertrophy, soft S1, uh, wide splitting of S2, plus S3 and S4. This is a pathological heart size. I know that the previous part is something boring and uh, no, not, um, you, you don't have anything to study it, but you have a need to know three or four things of each thing in case of you have asked about this. Uh, here, a most important uh, item the borsitic valve you can have a case of exam mitral valve replacement borsitic valve or aortic valve replacement borsitic valve uh, how can you approach for this definitely you will find a midline sternotomy scar midline sternotomy scar is very very important and the issue here try to know the click is matching with each uh, heart sound is it matching with the S1? So it's mitral valve replacement. Is it matching with S2? So it's aortic valve replacement. Okay. Um, you can have plus or minus atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension, especially in the mitral valve replacement. Okay. Uh, also, you can find a scar like mitral valvotomy. It indicates that this patient has a trial before mitral valve velocity. But it's failed, so they do for the patient porosetic valve. Okay. In uh, porosetic aortic valve replacement, you will find midline stenotomy scar, plus or minus search for permanent pacemaker scar because in aortic valve replacement, sometimes there is affection or damage of the conductive uh, system and they need to put a permanent pacemaker. So in porosetic aortic valve, search for permanent pacemaker scar. In mitral valve, search for mitral valve plastic scar. Here, I'd like to tell you an important thing. In any prosthetic valve, you may accept, uh, accept to find a flow functional stenotic murmur over this valve. So if you find stenotic murmur over this valve, it can be accepted. In mitral valve replacement, you can hear the click coincide with S1, plus you can hear mitral stenotic murmur. Which is the same. We will repeat again. Yeah. Uh, mid diastolic rumbling murmur at the apex, best heard in expiration in left lateral position. Plus, you hear the click of S1 and you feel the midline stenotomy scar. So, this is mid, this is a prosthetic mitral valve replacement with a functional flow murmur uh, of mitral stem. This is accepted. Okay. The same in prosthetic aortic valve replacement. You can hear the metallic click coincide with the second heart sound. 
and you can hear a functional systolic murmur like aortic stenosis with the same character of aortic stenosis, which is, we repeat again, injection systolic murmur, okay? But in this case, it will not be propagated to the cord. But you will find ejection systolic murmur at the uh, aortic area, okay? Uh, the important thing here, not accept a mitral regurgitation in mitral valve bruises or aortic regurgitation in a mitral in aortic valve uh, bruises. It means that any uh, regurgitation murmur over a prosthetic valve is not accepted and it indicates that the valve there is a failure or problem in uh, dysfunction in the bruises. Okay. Okay. Here, next for uh, this, go to uh, another thing I'd like to inform you regarding the uh, any prosthetic valve patient with a prosthetic valve uh, replacement. Put on your mind that this is a precious valve and this is a precious patient, and you have to search for signs of infective endocarditis very carefully, starting from fever, fever even if it is mild grade fever. Uh, check splinter hemorrhage, Osler nodule, uh, check splenomegaly, sometimes mild splenomegaly. So, and there's a famous question usually asked uh, in case of prosthetic valves, the examiner asks you, if this patient has fever, what will you think? So, first number one is susceptibility of infective endocarditis, and you have to do the work of infective endocarditis. We will mention that later regarding the blood culture and the echo -cardiopathy. okay? What is the complication of any prosthetic valve replacement? This is a common question. Complication of prosthetic valve replacement is number one, infective endocarditis. Don't miss this, infective endocarditis is very important. If it is early, it means, I mean, in the early first two months after operation, the most common organism will be staph epididymis, which raise from the skin, staph epididymis. If it is late, it means this patient has valve replacement uh, one year, two years, five years, etc. So the most common organism will be streptococcus veridans, and it will be a blood spirit. Second complication is thromboembolism through this valve. And so this patient is very important to take lifelong anticoagulation for life and to ensure optimum anticoagulation with INR level to reach to the target, which is two to three, and in some cases can reach to 2.5 to 3.5, okay? We'll come to this later also. Uh, other complication is the over anticoagulation. This patient might have bleeding, ecchymosis, purpura, bleeding from nose, from mouse, from any place. And uh, if you find a prosthetic valve case and you find ecchymosis in the abdomen or in the hand, you have to mention it. it is a very important sign. So this is a case of mitral valve prosthesis with functional mitral stenosis and midline stotum scar and the bulbs, blah, 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 blah. And there is no signs of vertebral endocarditis, no signs of pulmonary hypertension, no signs of congestive heart failure, and there is a sign of ecchymotic patch over the right arm, for example. Denoting over anticoagulation also. Also, as a sign, as a complication is the uh, anemia. Uh, anemia can be due to uh, either bleeding from anticoagulation or hemolysis or due to infective uh, endocarditis. Uh, other thing is a valve failure. A valve failure. Dehiscence leaking or uh, this is the uh, complications uh, of a prosthetic valve replacement. Some, some, some author, uh, the, the target INR, uh, lastly, is uh, from 2 to 3. If in case of uh, atrial fibrillation, 2 to 3. In case of aortic valve uh, replacement, 2 to 3. In case of mitral valve replacement, it need higher dose. Uh, at, uh, 2.5 to 3.5, and in some cases up to 4. In high risk uh, cases, like if the patient has double valve replacement plus atrial fibrillation, you can make it uh, risk versus benefit for the patient, but you can reach up to uh, 4 in some specific uh, circumstances. Okay. Uh, 
this is a prosthetic valve. What about tissue valve? Tissue valve, you can face it in the yani, normal life, but just to have a hint, tissue valve, the two types, the demo graft and homograft. Homograft is coming from the cadaveric patient, xenograft is coming from animals. And there is a specific indication for tissue valve replacement. It's very important to know there is three specific indications for uh, tissue valve replacement. Uh, number one, elderly patient with shorter life expectancy. It means that the patient is about 70 years old and you do not expect that he will live more than 10 years like this. So you replace by tissue valve because tissue valve has advantages that no need for uh, lifelong anticoagulation. Sometimes take uh, antibiotic only. Uh, so if older patient, elderly, severely elderly, you can put it uh, tissue valve. Also, if you have a patient with a contraindication to taking anticoagulation for life, or a patient is in young, in uh, uh, female, and she wants to have a family, uh, you can put for her tissue valve. And uh, as you know, the tissue valve is uh, live for 10 to 15 years. And after that, you can replace it again by metallic valve uh, and let her to finish the. Uh, her, her period of getting pregnancy by a tissue valve in this, or you can replace by a prosthetic valve and uh, ad advise her to stop uh, warfarin during pregnancy because warfarin is uh, contraindicated during pregnancy. Uh, although some yani, contra yani, uh, debate about uh, this warfarin can be used or cannot be, but definitely it is contraindicated in first trimester because it affects. Uh, uh, genesis of the baby and the contraindicated in the last trimester because it will affect uh, heroic bleeding and the placenta separation uh, for pregnancy. Also, if patient has uh, infective uh, endocarditis uh, and uh, the tissue valve has a characteristic feature of more resistant to infection. Okay. As you mentioned, the metallic valve has a life span of uh, more than the tissue valve, which can reach to 20 to 30 years old. So it is usually indicated in patients uh, younger, and it will require a lifelong uh, anticoagulation. Uh, now we can shift to another topic, which is uh, tricuspid stenosis and tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, to be honest with you, tricuspid stenosis is not commonly come in the exam and difficult to 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 elicit it. So let us speak about tricuspid regurgitation. As we mentioned, it's a pan-systolic murmur over the tricuspid area, which is in the left force intercostal space, of, as we mentioned. It will be loudest in inspiration, and it's usually associated with a signs of uh, right side heart failure, elevated uh, GVD, especially the V-wave, and uh, right uh, ventricular heave, hepatic congestion, Hepatic pulsation, ascites, lower limb edema, all the uh, manifestation of the uh, right sided heart failure. So, this is in case of tricuspid regurgitation. Most common cause is definitely the rheumatic heart disease uh, in uh, infective endocarditis, especially as IV drug users, uh, right ventricular dilatation, uh, either secondary to pulmonary hypertension, carcinoid syndrome, uh, congenital disease like Epstein anomaly. Stein anomaly, it means that the uh, tricuspid valve is going down to the, uh, to the ventricle, mean atrialization of the uh, right ventricle. Uh, this is a congenital uh, anomaly like Epstein anomaly or uh, ASCD or uh, AV canal uh, defect. Okay, this is the tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, another topic is the ACD and the VACD, atrial septal defect and ventricular septal defect. Um, also, to be frankly speaking, so, and it is not uncommon to find ACD in the exam, uh, but uh, in, uh, in, 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 in ACD or VACD, the issue is uh, usually the shunt between the right and the left. It is start firstly between the left side to the right side. So from the left side of the heart, go to the right side of the heart. The blood is going across uh, across this defect. 
so in in case of uh, يعني atrial septal defect, you can imagine with me that uh, here. Here are the effect and VSD effect. Tricuspid valve, this is mitral valve, this is the ASD, this is the VSD. The blood is moved from the left side to the right side. Why? Because the pressure in the left side is higher than the pressure in the right side. And when blood goes from left atrium to the right atrium, and then from the right atrium it will go to the right ventricle and from the right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation. Uh, so it will across to the pulmonary circulation and it will make a murmur over the pulmonary valve is in case of our ASD. It will make a murmur over the pulmonary valve. It's mimic pulmonary stenosis. Uh, and with a long time of the blood go from the left side to the right side and from the right atrium to right ventricle and from right ventricle to pulmonary circulation, it will uh, lead to the increase the pressure in the pulmonary circulation and develop pulmonary hypertension. When the pulmonary hypertension developed here, uh, the the pulmonary pressure will be in uh, will be increased. Pulmonary pressure will be increased, and uh, at, at this time the chunk will not go will not go from the same direction from uh, left to right, it will go reversal direction, I mean from right side to left side, when they develop the uh, pulmonary hypertension. Th this is called Eisenmenger syndrome. So Eisenmenger syndrome means that there is a shunt between ASCD or, or BSD, and firstly the uh, blood is going from the left to the right, then to reach to the uh, pulmonary circulation, and after a while, uh, there is increased pressure in the pulmonary hypertension, and after the pulmonary hypertension, it will make the right side of the heart, the pressure in the right side will be more than higher than. The, can you imagine the pressure in the right side will be more than the pressure in the left side? So the shunt will be reversed here and here. This is called a Eisenmenger uh, syndrome. Uh, coming back to the ASCD in the blood flow coming more over the pulmonary area, so it will be a, a manifestation of a pulmonary stenosis, okay, and uh, it will raise the issue like ejection systolic murmur as a pulmonary area, and uh, you can hear a mid-diastolic row murmur like tricuspid stenosis, because like, as it is much blood is coming here, so like tricuspid stenosis, like pulmonary stenosis, and ejection click, which is due to dilatation of the uh, pulmonary artery due to gushing of blood to the pulmonary vessels. And uh, as we mentioned, it will be wide fixed splitting of AC2 uh, because uh, there is a space between A2 and B2 because pulmonary closure of the pulmonary valve take long time due to long blood flow across the pulmonary circulation. So the cornerstone is increasing the blood flow to the lung through the pulmonary circulation, make the pulmonary valve close later, so wide splitting, and it will elevate, it will reveal a, a, a loud B2 and ejection click due to dilatation and murmur like pulmonary stenosis and murmur like tricuspid uh, stenosis. Okay. Uh, in VSD, there is a pan systolic murmur, as we mentioned before. Band systolic murmur, harsh, loud, radiated all over the pericardium, and loud at the lower left sternal edge. And uh, sometimes there is a murmur like mitral stenosis you can uh, hear. It's a mid diastolic rumbling murmur over the apex, like the mitral uh, stenosis, because uh, the blood go from here, left ventricle to right ventricle, and from right ventricle to pulmonary circulation, and from pulmonary circulation go to the right atrium, uh, sorry, left atrium and left ventricle. So there's a much blood across the mitral valve, so it will make a murmur, mimic the mitral stenosis. Uh, here, this uh, paragraph is speak about how can you correlate the uh, the murmur lens due to uh, the severity of the murmur. It is not matched with the uh, VSD. It means that the when the loudest 
بي اس دي ات نوت كورليت ويز ذا سايز اند ذا لود ميرمر از دي تو هاي فلو فيلوستي ثرو ذا سمول بي اس دي اوكي اند اف ذا ميرمر ديس ابير ذس مين ذات ذا ذير از ايزنينجر سندروم ديفلوب سو وين ذا بيشنت هاز بي اس دي اند يو فيل ذا ميرمر از لود ذس از نوت يعني ديفينتلي باد سايد Uh, but the issue that this that this murmur of BSD is not correlated with the size, so it will not indicate a size of this because it's a flow murmur. This is number one. Number two, when uh, you have a patient and you already know that he has a murmur of BSD, and you with follow up you notice that the murmur trying disappear or be quieter or decrease, this is not a good sign. This is a bad sign. It means that the Eisenmenger syndrome is developed. It means that the pulmonary circulation pressure is high, so the shifting here is forbidden, and the blood is go from here to here. And the blood is from right side to left side is a bad sign because it is deoxygenated blood coming from right side to left side, and so the patient will develop Eisenmenger syndrome, i.e. it will develop cyanosis, shortness of place, and clubbing. Okay, so, In both ACD and VCD, we can reach to the final that pulmonary hypertension will reach to shunt reversal. It means the shunt will be shifted from left to right, sorry, from left to right, yes, to be right to left, which is more hazardous. So it will be shifted to uh, right side to the left side, and it will uh, raise the Eisenmenger syndrome, cyanosis, clubbing, short stress, and Manifestation of pulmonary hypertension. All the manifestation of pulmonary hypertension that we mentioned before, loud pulmonary component of second heart sound, right ventricular heave, right ventricular thrill, tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary regurgitation, which is called Graham's steel murmur, and right sided heart failure due to this tricuspid regurg in the form of GVB elevated, hepatic congestion, lower limb edema. Okay, and definitely after this right side heart failure, it can lead to. Left-sided heart failure. For differential diagnosis and the causes of ACD and the BCD, uh, the ACD plus mitral stenosis it can be found in two conditions. So either what's called uh, Lutenbacher syndrome, it's a congenital ACD plus acquired rheumatic heart disease developed mitral stenosis. So if patient has congenital ACD and it develops rheumatic heart disease, which to mitral stenosis, this is a Lutenbacher syndrome. Or can be iatrogenic ACD in case of a balloon mitral valvoplasty. They insert a catheter from the right side, which to the left side through the aortic, through the atrial septum. So it make iatrogenic ACD, but it is rare uh, to to happen. Okay. In causes of BSD, either genetic, which is usually the Down syndrome, so when you find the patient Down, you expect to have AV canal defect or uh, ventricular septal defect, or it may be antenatal, maternal diabetes mellitus or fetal alcohol syndrome. So it means that the mother has uncontrolled diabetes or the mother does drink alcohol too much during pregnancy. Uh, or BSD can be due to post myocardial infarction with septal uh, rupture. Or uh, iatrogenic uh, in case of uh, basing of uh, right ventricle by the wire, or hookum septal ablation. Uh, you are reaching uh, the septum of the left ventricle, so you can affect the uh, septum between the two ventricles. So this is the causes of VCD: genetic, antenatal, post MI, iatrogenic by basing or by hookum septal ablation. Uh, another. Uh, item is uh, complications. What is the complication of ACD or VCD? Uh, the complication is uh, here in ACD there is atrial arrhythmia, in VCD there is recurrent bronchopneumonia. The patient with VCD has pneumonia chest infection, or there is aortic regurgitation with large membranous VCD. In VCD, the membranous part, and I, I, I forget to tell you. When there is VCD, this is the septum. Uh, the, the, the above part is a membranous part, and the below part is a muscular part. And this is right ventricle, and this is, okay, this is the uh, left ventricle. 
uh, if there is large membrane sphere, if this membrane spot is large and uh, freely mobile like this, it can uh, make a complication of uh, aortic uh, regurgitation. Okay. Uh, other complication is the same here and here is a paradoxical embolization. Paradoxical embolization, it means that uh, embolus uh, reached from the right side of the heart going to the left side, uh, left side of the, of the uh, 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 sorry, I mean paradoxical embolization. There is embolus uh, reaching like, uh, say, stroke. Yes, stroke uh, happened to the patient. He has a DVT, for example. The patient has a DVT, so uh, this is a venous venous embolization. This is stroke go to the right side of the heart, right atrium, and then from uh, right atrium it can go here to the left atrium and from left atrium to the left ventricle and from left ventricle to the aorta, reaching to a stroke. This is called a paradoxical. Embolization. Okay. Uh, other complication is the Eisenmenger syndrome here and here, pulmonary hypertension, definitely, because this is the cause of Eisenmenger syndrome. And uh, right sided heart failure due to pulmonary hypertension, it will lead to right sided heart failure. And definitely, uh, by long standing right sided heart failure, it will reach to uh, left sided heart failure. Okay. And infective endo problems. What is the treatment of ASCD and VSD? This is very important. The ASCD, uh, the treatment is infective endocarditis prophylaxis if indicated, if, if needed or if indicated. Uh, we will know later what is the indication of infective endocarditis. Uh, some authors recommend infective endocarditis prophylaxis while patients going to bursitis uh, to operation like this. And the guideline changes again, no need for infective endocarditis. And again, they recommend the infective endocarditis prophylaxis, especially in the congenital heart disease or the patient with high risk for infective endocarditis or previous infective endocarditis, or he, it will do a uh, septic operation. So still infective endocarditis can be recommended, especially in high risk patient or high risk procedure like this. Uh, the treatment will be in the form of an ACD. Uh, if a small ACD and no pulmonary hypertension, there is no treatment is required. If there is large hemodynamically significant ASCD, we will treatment, we will do an uh, surgery. Okay, we'll do the surgery. And plus, you need to treat the congestive heart failure and to treat the pulmonary hypertension by this medication. So, this is the treatment of effective endocarditis. Boroflex, sorry, the treatment of ASCD, infective endocarditis, boroflexes if needed. If a small and normal pulmonary hypertension, no treatment. If large and hemodynamically significant, it will be fixed surgically. And treatment of heart failure, treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension, if it is still reversible, pulmonary hypertension, I mean, it not reach to Eisenmenger syndrome, the treatment of pulmonary hypertension by these uh, three medications. Bosentan, sildenafil, ibu, rustinol. Bosentan is the endocelin uh, antagonist. Sildenafil is phosphodiesterase uh, receptor 5 uh, inhibitor. Phosphodiesterase 3 is 5 inhibitor, and uh, ibuprostinol is a uh, prostaglindin uh, analog or prostanoid uh, intravenous infusion. Okay. Uh, in case of uh, surgery, when indication surgery in ACD, if there is increased pulmonary over systemic blood flow, equal or more than two, plus there is left ventricular dysfunction. This is the indication of surgery. And the contraindication of surgery, if it is irreversible pulmonary hypertension. So if the pulmonary hypertension reaches to an irreversible state, and there's development already of Einstein-Mengen syndrome, so no need for surgery for ASCD, okay? The same for VSCD, there is infective endocarditis prophylaxis if indicated, and if it is large, hemodynamically significant, it will uh, VSD, so this is VSD. Uh, we will uh, treat the congestive heart failure and the treatment of the uh, pulmonary hypertension. Okay. What is the indication for surgery for VSD if pulmonary over systemic flow more than or equal to two plus left ventricular dysfunction? This is for indication of VSD surgery. 
or if there is history of infective enterocarditis, or if there is aortic regurgitation due to a prolapse of the aortic valve leaflet through the membranes VSCD, as we mentioned before. If the membrane is part of VSCD making a prolapse and affect the aorta and make aortic regurgitation, or post myocardial infarction and rupture of the sick. This is the four indication for surgery in case of VSCD. What is the contraindication of surgery in VSCD? Irreversible pulmonary hypertension, the same like ACD. If the pulmonary hypertension reaches to irreversible state and there is development of Eisenmenger syndrome, so no role of surgery for this patient. So the issue to pick up these cases firstly before they develop pulmonary hypertension and they develop Eisenmenger syndrome. So now, uh, short brief about Eisenmenger syndrome. It is pulmonary hypertension with shifting of the shunt to be right side to left side in case of VSCD, ASD, beta and ductus arteriosus. What is the complication of Eisenmenger syndrome? Many complications. Right ventricular failure because the pulmonary hypertension, it will affect the right side of the heart. Uh, and angina, arrhythmia, arrhythmogenic, infective endocarditis, very important. Hemoptysis due to pulmonary, pulmonary condition and pulmonary hypertension. Recurrent pneumonia because the lung is congested and pulmonary hypertension and lung congestion, so high frequency of bronchopneumonia. Paradoxical embolization, as I mentioned to you before, uh, reach to the stroke and TIA. Also, maybe this embolization coming from septic area, it reaches to the brain and the brain abscess. Also, due to this uh, hypoxia, the second bulbosemia will be developed, and the patient has high hemoglobin. If you see a patient with ACD or ACD, you will find the hemoglobin reach 20. Hemoglobin is 20, hematocrit is more than 60. So this is bulbosemia, and it will reach to hyperviscosity syndrome and affect the circulation. Also, there is bleeding disorder because uh, blood diseases due to this hyperviscosity and bulbosemia. Also, hyperuricemia and gout due to the large amount of uh, RBCs and the uh, degradation of these RBCs will lead to hyperuricemia. And this is a complication of Eisenmenger syndrome. Eisenmenger syndrome is a poor prognosis, and the survival rate is less than 50% beyond the age of 25 years. So if you reach Eisenmenger syndrome, this is a bad sign. What is the management of Eisenmenger syndrome? If I have a patient now with Eisenmenger, what I can do for him? This can be a common question in the exam. Uh, the management of anything, as we know, is started by the non-pharmacological and the pharmacological and the uh, surgical intervention or precautions or uh, procedure, I mean. Non-pharmacological is to ask the patient to stop smoking and stop alcohol and avoid dehydration, avoid exposure to hot condition because it, hot condition will increase the possibility of the uh, shunt to be go from the right side to the left side. So this is a general uh, instructions. Uh, also, if the patient is female, ask her for contraception for life because it might affect her life during pregnancy and might affect her baby. If the patient has cyanosis, you can give oxygen. Uh, regarding pharmacological treatment, as we mentioned before, the infective endocarditis prophylaxis, treatment of congestive heart failure by diuretics, uh, lasix, uh, spironolactone, like this. Treatment of pulmonary hypertension by the three famous medication. Bosentan, sildenafil, ibuprostenone. Bosentan is endocelin antagonist. antagonist. Antagonist is the endocelin, which is both a constricted uh, constrictor material. Sildenafil is making venodilatation through the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibition. And uh, ibuprostenol, it is a uh, prostaglandin like uh, material. It's called a prostanoid giving IV infusion. It's very, very expensive. And regarding a surgical or procedure maneuver can be done in Eisenmenger syndrome, we can make vein section for the patient to decrease the hematocrit, especially if the hematocrit is more than 65. And rule firstly, the patient may be dehydrated, so give good hydration for the patient because the patient has high viscosity and uh, secondary to the Also, a surgical repair can be done in the, for the primary cardiac effect, the ACD or BCD or beta ducts are used, but on only one condition. If you are sure that this pulmonary hypertension is reversible. If the pulmonary hypertension is irreversible, so no value for treating this Eisenmenger syndrome. And lastly, the patient will be candidate for heart and lung transplantation. Okay. Uh, 
here I am speaking about investigations for a cardiac case. When you finish the examination and you present your finding and you say the diagnosis and differential diagnosis, you will be asked about what will you do for this patient? What is the investigations? Uh, here's the investigation in any cardiac patient, it will be the following. Basic investigation in the form of uh, CBC, complete blood count, urea and electrolyte, liver function test, lipid profile, and the blood sugar. And don't forget the INR, especially in a prosthetic valve for the target INR level. CBC, uh, definitely white blood cells for the infection, the hemoglobin for patient's anemia or hemolysis, urea and electrolyte for the kidney function is very important because electrolyte disturbance will uh, induce arrhythmia. Kidney function is very important uh, for uh, if patient has affected endocarditis, you will want to give vancomycin, gentamicin, you need to adjust the dose, you need to follow up the serum creatinine. Liver function test is important also because in patient has a heart failure, especially right side of the heart failure, it might have a hepatic congestion and there is a, a deranged liver function and a cholestasis and you find the uh, bilirubin is high, especially the direct bilirubinemia. Lipid profile is very important because carrying hyperlipidemia is carrying a risk factor for ischemic heart disease. Blood sugar also to carry because it carries a risk factor for ischemic heart disease. After that, the template for investigation is the ECG to know if it's normal sinus or there is any specific type of arrhythmia or if any specific stigmata or any uh, voltage criteria matching with right ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular hypertrophy or any bundle branch block right, like right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block. Also chest x-ray to see lung congestion, pleural effusion uh, like this. Echocardiography is very important to see the ejection fraction of the patient, the left ventricular function, regional motion abnormality, the valvular lesion, any associated valvular lesion, pulmonary hypertension, tricuspid regurgitation, and you can measure the pulmonary atrial systolic pressure by echocardiography. And lastly, the uh, cardiac catheterization or coronary angiography. Coronary angiography to check the coronary vessels is very essential and very mandatory before any cardiac surgery. If any patient you will do for him aortic valve replacement or mitral valve, any valve replacement or any cardiac surgery, you have to do coronary angiography before the surgery to uh, ensure that you have a maintained good uh, vasculature of the heart. Otherwise, you can go and open the heart for valve and plus cabbage in the same time. Okay? So suppose you do coronary angiography and you find multivessel disease. So, and you need to do, this patient is old age and you need to do aortic uh, replacement. Uh, at this stage, you do aortic valve replacement beside uh, cabbage, okay? And also cut the catheterization to check the chamber and the, uh, any effect uh, between ACD, VSD, uh, or any uh, valve lesion or any pressure uh, difference. Regarding the target INR, as we mentioned in AF2 to 3, aortic valve is 2 to 3, in mitral valve, prosthetic replacement. Usually in mitral, we need more because aortic valve usually is coming with the, uh, the same tract, the same tract with the left ventricle, the aorta here. So, uh, but the mitral here, the blood is coming from left atrium to left ventricle, then go to the aorta. Uh, so the mitral valve need higher uh, target for IMR, 2.5 to 3.5, and as I mentioned to you, in some cases, you might need H24. What about management of any cardiac case? After you being asked about what you will do for the patient, what will you do for this patient as a management plan? Uh, any management plan, as we know, it confirms of non-pharmacological, pharmacological and surgical. It will be simply like this. Non-pharmacological patient education, patient counseling, lifestyle modification to stop smoking, to stop alcohol, uh, diet modification, exercise, like this. All these are non-pharmacological. Regarding pharmacological treatment, treatment of the heart failure by anti-heart failure medications, as we all know, yeah, furosemide, spironolactone, uh, AC inhibitor or ARBIS, uh, beta blocker, unless there is any lung congestion, and uh, statins, antiblatelet if indicated. So this is treatment of congestive heart failure. Treatment of pulmonary hypertension, as we mentioned before, is the three important indications. Uh, Inducing receptor antagonist and the process prosta. Uh, cytoline analog and uh, sildenafil phosphodiesterase 5 uh, inhibitor. Treatment of any arrhythmia, especially if there is AF, rate control and arrhythmic control uh, and anticoagulation. Rate control by beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Anticoagulation uh, by warfarin or vitamin K antagonist or by the new oral anticoagulant, which is the 
rivaroxaban, abixaban, dabigotran. Uh, and lastly, the infective enterocarditis prophylaxis, if indicated. Okay, the indication of infective enterocarditis simply in case of any prosthetic valve, definitely um, you have to give infective enterocarditis prophylaxis, or if the patient has previous exposure to infective enterocarditis, or you have a transplanted heart or any corrected congenital heart disease. This is the indication of indications of infective endocarditis. Lastly, the surgical treatment for the any cardiac disease. The surgical would be specific to each lesion. I mean, what is the indication for surgical replacement in mitral stenosis? What is the indication of uh, mitral valve replacement in mitral stenosis? What is the indication of mitral valve replacement in mitral regurgitation? We will see now. What is the indication of aortic valve replacement in aortic stenosis? What is the indication of aortic valve uh, replacement in aortic regurgitation? This is, uh, yeah, I mean, rabbit. Um, summary indications for surgery in aortic stenosis and in aortic regurgitation in comparison. Uh, firstly, if the patient is symptomatic, what does it mean by symptomatic? It means has low cardiac output. Low cardiac output, he has syncope, he has angina, he has dyspnea. So he is said he has syncope, he has angina, he has dyspnea due to heart failure. So the patient is symptomatic and the uh, aortic valve is severely stenotic by a mean. Uh, mean peak gradient is more than 50 millimeter mercury and the aortic valve area is less than one centimeter square. This is criteria of severe aortic stenosis and the patient is symptomatic. Or the patient is asymptomatic, the patient is asymptomatic and uh, you have a severe aortic stenosis by this criteria plus you will do other surgery for the patient. Like you will do cabbage, so you will do valve replacement also. So you will do aortic valve replacement in this patient who has severe aortic stenosis plus other cardiac surgery, although he is asymptomatic. Okay. Also, maybe the patient asymptomatic and have severe aortic stenosis plus one of the following. He has left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Uh, uh, he has abnormal blood pressure response to exercise treadmill test. When the patient doing treadmill test running, there's abnormal blood pressure response. This is manifestation of the cardiac output is affected and this patient need to do aortic valve replacement. Also, if the patient has a VTAC, all the valve area is below 0.6 centimeter square. This is the indication of aortic valve replacement in case of aortic stenosis. What about the indication of aortic valve replacement in case of aortic regurgitation? The same, if the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. The patient is symptomatic, the patient has severe aortic regurgitation and the symptoms symptomatic by angina or uh, heart failure. Or the patient is asymptomatic with the following. He is asymptomatic with ejection fraction is less than 50% or he has left ventricular dilatation, especially the left ventricular end systolic diameter is more than 55. Or the patient has aortic root dilatation more than 50 millimeter or the pulse, pulse pressure is more than 100 millimeter mercury. Okay, you will notice here that ejection fraction is less than 50 and left ventricular end systolic diameter is more than 55. Okay, because uh, we will change this in a uh, mitral regurgitation. What about type of aortic valve replacement? We replace aortic valve either by open heart surgery or by balloon valvoplasty or by TAVI. TAVI, it means uh, transcutaneous aortic valve implantation. This is the most advanced uh, technique now is done, doing for aortic valve replacement, especially in elderly patient, especially patient unfit for general surgery. And this is a, a great uh, advance in, in, in intervention cardiology, TAVI. Uh, this is types of aortic valve replacement. Coming to the uh, mitral valve, what is the indication for surgery in mitral stenosis and in mitral uh, regurgitation? Patient has uh, mitral stenosis, what is the indication for surgery? We have four indications. Pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary congestion, hemoptysis, recurrent thromboembolism events despite the patient taking proper and good anticoagulation. So this is the four indication for mitral stenosis. We have patient mitral stenosis and pulmonary hypertension, we, we need mitral replacement. Pulmonary stenosis with pulmonary congestion, the form of left ventricular uh, failure. Mitral stenosis with hemoptysis due to lung congestion. Mitral stenosis with recurrent thromboembolism, although the patient taking adequate anticoagulation. 
all these the indications of mitral valve replacement in case of mitral stenosis. What about mitral regurgitation? What are the indications of mitral valve replacement in case of mitral regurgitation? If the patient is symptomatic with NEHA plus three or four, NEHA and New York Heart Association means the dyspnea is grade class three and the class four, and it is a severe dyspnea, or the patient asymptomatic, but you are following echo every six months and you find that ejection fraction below than 60 and lift and trigger in systolic diameter is more than 45. Okay, this is also the same uh, numbers in uh, aortic regurgitation, but uh, the mitral valve replacement is to be done earlier than aortic valve replacement. Okay, what is the criteria of uh, doing mitral valvoplasty? Sometimes in mitral stenosis, we can do open surgery or do mitral valvoplasty. Mitral valvoplasty is what I told you, do not miss the scar, which is uh, below the nibble of the left nibble. Okay, uh, indication doing mitral valvoplasty in case of mitral stenosis. If I have mitral stenosis and the valve are mobile valve, mobile valve, i.e., there is loud first heart sound and there is audible opening snake. So the mitral valve is mobile and there is no calcification because if this calcification will do valvoplasty, valvoplasty means you are making dilatation of the valve. You will make rupture of the valve if there is calcium. Also, uh, to be sure that there is no mitral regurgitation because if you make dilatation of the stenotic valve, which is already on a, on a, on a, dil on a dilated or regurgitation, so you will increase the mitral regurgitation and you will make the patient suffer more. And in this stage, if the patient has mitral regurgitation, on top of a mitral stenosis, it's better to replace the mitral valve surgery rather than valvoplasty. Lastly, that to confirm that there is no left atrial thrombus by doing transthoracic echo and the transesophageal echo to confirm that there is no left atrial thrombus. Because if the patient has mitral stenosis and there is dilated left atrium and this thrombi and you dilate the mitral stenosis by valvoplasty, the, all the uh, showers and all the the, the clotting in the here, here there is clotting here. All this will be bust down if, the, if you dilate the mitral valve and from the uh, left atrium to the left ventricle and from the left ventricle it will go to the systemic circulation. So patient, patient will immediately have stroke. So this is the indications for surgery in two cases of mitral stenosis and the mitral regurgitation. Uh, some yani, small hints, if you allow me to continue. Modified, what is the modified Dukes criteria of effective endocarditis? Yani how you diagnose effective endocarditis? You have a diagnostic uh, criteria, it's called modified Dukes criteria. It consists of major and minor criteria. What is the major criteria and what is the minor criteria? Let's see. The major criteria is two, the echocardiography and the blood culture. Echocardiography, you can find an abscess, you will find a vegetations, or you find a new regurgitation normal. This is very important. You have a new regurgitation normal, so you will think about effective enterocolitis. Or this dehiscence of a prosthetic valve. Yani it means that there's a prosthetic valve, and you hear a dehiscence. It means that there's a regurgitation normal of a prosthetic valve. So this is the echocardiography finding, and plus the blood culture to have a typical organism in two blood culture. Two blood culture mean you take a, a, a separate uh, two sample from two different uh, sites and at least one hour apart. This is a blood culture. What is the minor criteria? Minor criteria is uh, five minor criteria. Number one is equal to be suggestive but not conclusive. Number two, uh, the sorry, there is six minor criteria. There is echo to be suggestive, blood culture to be positive, but with a typical organism, or the patient has fever more than 38 in high suspicious case, or fever of unknown origin, and you cannot decide uh, the cause of the fever, fever of unknown origin, or fever in a prosthetic valve, or rheumatic heart disease, or cardiac patient. Uh, any predisposing risk, like uh, patient has a prosthetic valve, or patient has uh, IV drug user like this, and uh, some immunological phenomena or vascular phenomena. Immunological phenomena like uh, glomerulonephritis, uh, Osler nodule, uh, like uh, rough spots in uh, fungus examination, or positive rheumatoid factor can be positive in effective endocarditis. 
also a vascular uh, phenomena. Vascular phenomena like Janeway lesion in the hand or in the feet, or emboli, septic emboli, mycotic aneurysm of the brain, intracerebral hemorrhage. This is the minor criteria. What I need, I need uh, two major or one major and two minor or five minor. This is the criteria for diagnosis with two major or one major, two minor or five minor. Remember that the blood culture, there is two blood, uh, sorry, three blood, three blood sample uh, from uh, three different size with uh, one hour uh, apart. Okay. So you took the blood culture in two uh, station. Uh, by the way, infective endocarditis, you can remember the rheumatic fever. Yeah, it is not a common case, but you, can, you may be asked by this. Uh, what is the modified Jones criteria for the diagnosis of uh, rheumatic fever? We have also major criteria and uh, minor criteria. Uh, let's enumerate. The major criteria is uh, number one, uh, carditis. Number two, polyarthritis. Number three, chorea. It's abnormal uh, movement. It's called uh, rheumatic chorea. Uh, also, uh, subcutaneous uh, nodules. And lastly, the erythema marginata. Remember, erythema marginata, not erythema medusa. Erythema medusa, not sarcoidosis, but erythema marginata. And plus, you have a strong evidence of uh, group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection, like uh, sore throat or uh, skin lesion. Uh, by uh, streptococci, group A, beta hemolytic streptococcus strain. This is a major criteria. Minor criteria, uh, number one, uh, prolonged BR interval. You can see carditis, the opposite here, prolonged BR interval. Bully, arthritis, here, arthralgia. Just, just arthralgia. Uh, it means pain. Here, mean pain and the swelling and redness. And polyarthritis, usually a migratory arthritis. Here, just joint pain, prolonged BR interval, fever, uh, Bilexia or the patient has previous uh, rheumatic fever and increased inflammatory marker in the form of white blood cells or ESR or CRB. You need uh, two major or one major and two minor for diagnosis of this uh, rheumatic uh, fever. Uh, now I'm coming to the last thing. Uh, here, uh, this is uh, just to uh, let you know uh, the assessment in the exam, especially for the bases. Uh, this, this is distributed from the Royal College itself, uh, how they assess you in cardiovascular system examination. Uh, you, have, uh, you will be assessed by uh, these five skills, and it will be assessed by the two uh, examiner, each one voting either satisfactory or unsatisfactory or borderline. The satisfactory by one. Sorry, satisfactory by two mark. Borderline by one mark and unsuspected by uh, zero mark. So zero, one, two. And this is the, uh, and it double it by, by two. You, so by two examiner, you have to uh, reach the uh, mark of 20 for cardiac and for neuro and for the abdomen and for the chest. Uh, what is the uh, skills that you will be uh, assessed? Physical examination. I don't know if you can read or it is difficult for you to read, but I will tell you, uh, physical examination and identifying physical signs, the differential diagnosis, the clinical judgment, maintaining patient welfare. Easily, you will have the maintaining patient welfare. Easy to take two here and from other examiner two here. Just you respect the patient and deal with the patient in a sensitive manner and uh, ensure that he, he is comfortable and you, you respect him, uh, respect his dignity, safety, uh, ask him before any step, uh, check if he has any pain or no. Easy to uh, success in this maintaining patient welfare. Physical examination, just to do the steps of examination in a correct manner, in a fluent manner, in a systematic approach, in a professional way. Uh, that's what I asked you in the first of the presentation, to be familiar and fluent, how to do the steps of examination. Your brain is not thinking about the steps of examination and the exam. Your brain is thinking about the positive finding and how to interpret it to reach a diagnosis or differential diagnosis. Now, this is a time for practice on your partner, on your study partner, on your any colleague at home, or even in your uh, patient at your outpatient department or at uh, CCU or ICU. 
just to do the steps in a professional and fluent uh, technique. If you do it uh, by um, incorrectly, uh, you omit significant uh, important tests in an systematic approach, or you are hesitant, or you are not confident, or are unprofessional. This is unfortunately will be in this answer spectrum. Then second one is identifying physical sign. You have to identify correctly the physical signs, and uh, to not these two most important issues: not miss the important sign and do not find a not present sign. So if there is important sign, do not miss, and if there is no sign, do not invent a sign. This is very important. Do not invent a sign. If you are not sure, say I am not sure. They will respect you more. Then the differential diagnosis, you have to uh, construct a sensible differential diagnosis. What is a differential diagnosis? Enumerate it by order and by the most frequently and the most related to this case, the case that you are exam it in the exam. Uh, not to be a book doctor. Better to be uh, realistic and to apply it to the uh, case that you uh, face it in the exam. Uh, lastly, is the clinical judgment. The clinical judgment, it means uh, you have a proper Management plan. Management plan means what you will do for this patient. Investigation, lab, image, referral to multidisciplinary team, non-pharmacological and pharmacological and surgical procedure. So you do management plan, indicating, including investigations and uh, medications and management plan uh, through the all routes. Uh, lastly, I hope that uh, this session it will be uh, good and uh, I hope that you get benefit. I'm sorry for long uh, time. I don't uh, think that it will take a long time like this, but uh, uh, I hope it will be of benefit and uh, I need your feedback. And uh, if you have any concern or anything, uh, you are welcome to mention that too. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. شكرا جزيلا جماعه ثانك يو شوفكم على خير ان شاء الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته